Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. For today's video we are going to look at the fifth House of Night book. Now I know that I did a poll on my channel to ask like what you guys wanted to see next and not unanimously but what was in the clear lead was Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker but why am I out of breath from just like standing up? That is pathetic. But I actually got started on Fifty Shades Darker like six months ago and it's currently at a pace of you don't need to know exactly you don't need to know like the process but it's going to be an incredibly long video because there's just something wrong with every single line and I keep I'm trying to do it in more of like a joke 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 format doesn't matter you don't care it's not out yet what I'm trying to say is that it's going to take quite a while to to get it the way that I want it done. So I figured a lot of you love the House of Night series. I want to get through this series too. I always think because they're only about like between 350 and 400 pages long, these books, I always think, oh, it'll be like quite quick. No, I've got like 70 pages of script here. Again, you don't care about the process, but it's going to be a long video. So let's just dive into it. But before we go on with that, make sure that you check out my merch site, ayclothing.tmail.com, cop yourself some merch. Follow me on Instagram and I might just follow you back. Introductions. Acknowledgement. We'd like to send big XXX ooze to our lovely UK team at Little Brown, Brown Atom, with a special thank you to Samantha Smith for saving me when I was food poisoned in London. Gak. I'm so proud of my capital right now. Chapter one. Zoe is dreaming. Boy, I wish that was me. Bare legs, naked shoulders. I looked down and let out a little yip of surprise. It turned into like a terrier or something. I was wearing a seriously short buckskin mini dress. The top of it was cut in a wide V, front and back, so that it hung off my shoulders, leaving lots of skin visible. The dress itself was amazing. It was white and decorated with fringe, feathers and shells and seemed to glow in the moonlight. All over it was beaded with intricate designs that were impossibly beautiful. My imagination is so darn cool. Funny, because right now I'm imagining a giant anvil falling on your head, leaving a little like Zoe-shaped imprint in the floor. I spoke non hyphen chalantly. I don't know why that's hyphened. It's not a double barreled nail. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I've never spelt nonchalant like that. And yes, I <laughs> nonchalantly use nonchalant in my daily vocab. Yes, I'm better than you. Kelowna, the raven god who was resurrected at the end of the last book, I'm not hand-holding. If you want to know, if you clicked on this video being like, what's a house of night? You're going to have to watch like at least, I think, 10 hours worth of video before getting to this. So go do that. Thank you for like the 50p it will give me. Then see me afterwards. Kelowna, the raven god, is in her dream naked. I think he's like, well, technically because he's a demigod, he's immortal, right? So he's eternal. But I think in real life terms, he's about a thousand years old because they entrapped him a thousand years ago in the ground and she's a teenager she's 17 can we go one book without someone being a predator challenge impossible once before you commanded the elements you were made from them fashioned to love me <sighs> His massive dark wings stirred and lifted. The sheer audacity, the presumption of birdmen gods. Someone clip his wings. His laugh was seductive. I wanted to drown in it. Boy, I wish you would. I leaned forward, closing my eyes and gasping aloud as the chill of his spirit brushed against my breasts, sending shooting sensations that were painful but deliciously erotic to places in my body that made me feel out of control. Keep it in your pants, please. She doesn't want to do it with Kelowna, the raven man, so she tells him to do one and wakes up i keep thinking of that bloke what's that guy what's that guy the way of the warrior come on english kids you'll know what i will uk based kids i suppose you'll know what i mean was he irish irish man birds <laughs> the battle of the birds is a scottish fairy tale scotland battle of the birds behave what are you australia what's what's it called raven cbbc oh it's literally called raven I'm an idiot. For this raven man, that's what I keep thinking of with um, Kelowna here. <sighs> Chapter two. Zoe tells us all of the interesting things that have happened in the past few hours since the end of the last book. The pacing in these books is always terrible, but this one actually takes the piss because I will give you a spoiler right now. The first 100 pages are just recapping the hours in between the last book and this one. It's like three or four hours. The first 100 pages, the first like quarter of this book He's a son of Erebus Warrior. 
Aphrodite had added, giving him a surprisingly sweet smile. I describe it as surprisingly sweet because Aphrodite is usually selfish, spoilt, hateful, and kind of hard to tolerate in general, even though I'm starting to like her. Not even 10 pages in, the Aphrodite slander is happening. She lives rent-free in these people's heads. Oh, by the way, who are you talking to? Erin and Shorty are soul twins, not biological twins, being as Erin is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Oklahoma girl, and Shorty is a caramel-coloured Easterner of Jamaican descent. I'm going to cry. And as soon as I get my breath, I'll tell you how pleasantly surprised I was when I discovered the working refrigerators and microwaved, Damien said, following Jack into the room, breathing heavily and dramatically holding onto his side. You'll have to explain to me how you managed to get all of that down here, including the electricity, to ele electricity electric we haven't got any electricity that's from paddington bear to <laughs> to run it damien paused caught sight of stevie ray's bloody ripped shirt and the arrow that still protruded from her back and his pink cheeks blanched white you'll have to explain after you're fixed up and not en broche en brochette en brochette en brochette anymore and huh? Shawnee said. Bro, what? Erin said. I don't know whether to laugh or cry at this little exchange going on while Stevie Ray sits there with an arrow sticking out of her back, possibly dying. Oh, Jack and Damien are a couple, which means they're gay teenagers. Hello, it happens. Hello, piss off. More often than you'd expect. Wait, scratch that. Strike that. Reverse it. It happens more often than parents expect. OMG, what? Two? guys in a relationship doing hand holding and stuff i have never heard of that before in my life also why are they doing a new willy wonka with timothy chalamet why wrong sir wrong don't you think gene wilder's one was already perfect even like johnny depp's one was nowhere near as good as gene wilder's one so good day sir Thank you for coming to my TED talk. I said good day! We get a huge exposition dump because the cast duo loaded up on some fibre before writing this. They must love their bran flakes. Why? Why do I, why do I say these things? Aphrodite's humanity, <laughs> who knew she had any, mixed with the power of the five elements, all of which I can control. <laughs> Such a bitch, isn't she? And voila, Stevie Ray got her humanity back, along with some gorgeous adult vampire tattoos that look like vines and flowers framing her face. But instead of the tattoo being dark blue, it turned red, as in the color of fresh blood. Thanks for that, because I had no idea what the color red looked like, because I am an alien and my blood is green. Okay, before I sound like an uber jealous freak, let me explain. Eric Knight is to die for hot in a Superman Clark Kent kind of way, and to carry through with the superhero analogy, he's also talented and honestly a good guy. Spoiler alert, he's really not. Uh, vampire. Recently changed vampire at that. He's also my boyfriend. Uh, ex-boyfriend recently ex-boyfriend at that oh my god shut up shut up you brat sadly that means i'm going to be ridiculously jealous of anyone even one of the kind of freaky red fledglings who might be catching too much of his interest too much equals <laughs> any you don't get to be jealous when you have a constant rotation of several boyfriends at one time who are you tana mojo that's a topical joke the ones that get it get it zoe has new tattoos on her hands now because of the last book because she's also slowly becoming kat von d i'd realize then what that burning meant my goddess nyx the personification of night <laughs> the, the last things that i'm going to see before i die is just like all of the like you went see at gaia and the personification of night and why wow, i have like 10 boyfriends from this stupid fucking book had marked me again as exclusively hers had set me apart again from all the other fledglings and vampires in the world no other fledgling had a filled and expanded mark we know also so i'm totally writing my parody eroticas like i told you i'm actually doing it i'm actually doing something for the first time in my miserable little existence i've decided I'm going to take acting lessons because I think I'm sure it's actually hilarious because I'm way too self-conscious for that kind of thing but I just think I should I don't think anyone cares <laughs> about what I will do in my life but I just feel like I should learn to act all proper and stuff audible should hire me I don't know I've got a face for audible <laughs> that's our z jack said okay you're new here you've been here for like all of five minutes so you don't get to act this way i don't make the rules more than practically shawnee said but it's a zoe miracle they happen pretty much all the time erin said matter of factly i can't keep a tattoo and she's covered in them who else but quagmire aphrodite said 
figures, but her smile took the bite from her words. They are the mark of our goddess's favour, showing that you are, indeed, travelling the path she would choose for you. You are our high priestess, Darius spoke solemnly, the one Nyx has chosen. Why are they all taking turns to speak? Is this the Disney Channel? Yeah, Damien and I are gay. What? No, what? The twins hesitated, passing a look between each other. Erin spoke for both of them. Stevie Ray, are the red kids really okay? I mean, these are the kids who killed the Union football players and grabbed Z's human boyfriend, aren't they? This is the most sensible thing that the twins have ever said because they are dealing with certified killers. No one really cares though. They all bicker while Stevie Ray just lies there skewered like a chicken on a barbecue prong or a rotisserie chicken turning around slowly. <laughs> Like when Homer Simpson's in the oven, turning slowly for his sexual powers. I'm pretty sure that's Homer Simpson in the oven, rotating slowly. His body temperature has risen to over 400 degrees. He's literally stewing in his own juices. But they scarper off. Who scarpers off? I guess everyone scarpers off to be annoying elsewhere. Chapter three. It was about then that I'd really started to worry. Back at the House of Night, the undead dead Stark, one of Zoe's many boyfriends, followed Neferay's pain in the butt orders and shot Stevie Ray. Blood had spilled out of her body at an alarming rate, so much so that it had made the ground around her look like it was bleeding, which fulfilled the stupid prophecy to free the stupid fallen angel Kelowna from his gazillion year imprisonment in the earth. This is the savior of the vampire and human world. Someone that says gazillion. I shoved against the hard newly sliced end of the arrow as Darius bracing himself with one hand against Stevie Ray's shoulder pulled the arrow from her body in one swift awful sounding jerk so I know exactly how they feel right now wrenching the arrow out of Stevie Ray because one time I was drinking with a friend and she wanted to pierce her ear we were 18 this was an excellent idea, by the way, whilst we were drinking, right? So we soaked a needle in vodka and then she wanted to pierce it up here through the cartilage here. And I had to shove the needle through her ear up here. But blood started like pouring down from it and the angle, well, the, I don't think the needle would stay straight going through the cartilage and the angle was, it was a nightmare. It was disgusting. Someone else had to do it in the end because we were too much. And that was exactly like this scene. Also, I don't think you should pierce anything if you've been drinking because it thins the blood and makes you bleed. I've never had any piercings, by the way. No piercings, nothing, no lip, nothing. Can never get around to it. I'm incredibly lazy. So in my head, if I got a piercing, that means I just need to, I would have to buy more jewellery to have a rotation of different jewellery for the piercing and I'd probably lose it. I buy necklaces and then they're never here because I lose them so I've never had any piercings. Anyway Stevie Ray is close to death and she needs blood. Fresh blood would work better than that bland refrigerated stuff Darius said. He hadn't so much as glanced at Aphrodite but she definitely got the message. Oh for crap's sake am I supposed to let her bite me again? I blinked not sure what to say. Thankfully Darius came to the rescue. Ask yourself what your goddess would have you do, he said. Aphrodite can't catch a break. Even her boyfriend sees her as a walking blood bag. Stevie Ray bites her and it's all sensual. Okay, yes, it was disturbing and nasty, but it was also weirdly erotic. Keep it in your pants, Zoe. Anyway, we are what we are. And from observing what was going on with Stevie Ray and Aphrodite, it was clear that red vampires definitely had the whole bring your human pleasure ph phenomenon going. I mean, Aphrodite had even leaned suggestively into Darius, who wrapped an arm around her and bent to kiss her as Stevie Ray continued sucking on her wrist. The kiss between the warrior and Aphrodite had so much sizzle to it that I swear I could almost see sparks flying. I think when I originally read this series years ago, I repressed this scene because I don't remember Aphrodite snogging Darius as she gets the blood sucking pleasure from Stevie Ray. We are two seconds away from this being a category on Pornhub. The rest of the gang come into Gorp just had the kissing and stuff. This book is very interesting, isn't it? For a moment, I saw Aphrodite's unguarded expression. She shook her head slightly and her smile was tinged with honest wonder and more than a little sarcasm. And why the hell I have to keep saving Stevie Ray's country bumpkin ass, I do not know. All I can say is that I used to be really, really bad. So I have an unbelievable amount of shit I have to make up for. She's constantly saving Stevie Ray and the rest of them and gets nothing but dunked on in return. All because before she was a high school bully for a bit. It's not justification enough for any of this. Loses her humanity, has an imprint she doesn't want. And imprints are inherently sexual. Everyone's always spending her money because her parents are rich. The list just goes on and on and on. Oh, she has those visions that are actually really traumatizing. At the end of the last book, 
she was the only one that got them moving and away from the school because otherwise they all would have been brainwashed by Kelowna by now. She's the main character. Venus, Aphrodite's old friend who she thought was dead but is now a red fledgling, joins them just to be mean. With a mean smile, the blonde continued. I was just going to say how interesting it is that Stevie Ray and Aphrodite have imprinted. Aphrodite could have been a serial killer and that would not justify having to deal with an imprint with Stevie Ray. Chapter four. Well, spank me and call me your baby. No one clip that. No one, Shawnee said. Make that a double spanking twin, Erin chimed in. And then the two of them burst into semi-hysterical giggles. I think it's interesting, Damien spoke up so he could be heard over the cackling twins. Me too, Jack said, in a freaky, oh my God way. Sounds like karma has finally caught up with Aphrodite, Venus said with a sneer that made her beauty turn reptilian. So everyone reacts in a very mature manner to this. As I said before, imprints are inherently sexual. You get pleasure from them. Canonically, Stevie Ray and Aphrodite are both heterosexual. So I've never really understood the cast duo's point in doing this, considering everyone just always makes fun of them for it. I mean, Zoe tries to make the point of it's because they're both psychic and it's kind of that sort of connection thing but then why did they get like sexual pleasure from it it's a mess i feel like the cast duo are trying to be progressive but just failing as always venus brings up that zoe killed a red fledgling in the tunnels that doesn't make the girl you killed any less dead venus said as the red fledglings behind her stirred restlessly z you killed someone jack asked i opened my mouth to answer but venus beat me to it she did Elizabeth, no last name. I had to, I said simply, speaking to Jack and ignoring Venus and the red fledglings, even though something about them had the little hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. After this, her friends all completely ignore that they learned that Zoe killed someone. I don't think it's ever brought up again. No one cares. Not even in a, how do you feel about doing that kind of way, which I feel like if you found out one, even in self-defense, right? Because I actually, look, this is such a loaded thing to say. I, ex I accept that murder can, not, not murder, but killings can happen in self-defense, you know? Because if you punch someone like wrong on the temple, they can just die, right? So say you're defending yourself and you just like, someone can die from that. And I accept that it happens. But even if you did it in self-defense and you didn't like, you just wanted them to get off, you didn't mean it, yada, 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 that would still fuck you up. Like knowing you've killed someone, you'd have to be very hardened for it to not play on your mind, fuck you up, whatever. Zoe never needs any therapy from it. She never talks to anyone about the fact that, well, actually, no, she didn't just kill, she killed those two blokes, didn't she? Because she dropped them in front of a truck in one of the books and they, yeah. So Zoe's a serial killer at this point. That would fuck you up. You would have to talk about it. And none of her friends, you know, because if I found out that one of my friends accidentally killed someone in self-defense, I'd be like, are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? Because you would feel guilt, weren't you? What, why am I arguing with a book? My entire channel. Venus was sleek and sexy in a pair of tight designer jeans and a simple cropped black tank that had rhinestone skulls head on it. Her hair was long and thick and the kind of blonde that looked golden. In other words, she was definitely attractive enough to hang out of Aphrodite, which is saying something because Aphrodite is totally gorgeous. Zoe, maybe you want the imprint with Aphrodite. Making it work sounds good to me. Even though my internal alarm was still warning me that not all was sweetness and light with the red fledglings, I smiled at Stevie Ray who dimpled back at me. Okay, she obviously believed that we could figure out a way to get along. So maybe my alarm system was misfiring simply because Venus was a hateful bitch and not because she and the rest of them were evil incarnate. Firstly, the irony in Zoe calling anyone else a hateful bitch projection. We love to see it. But I think I read up until book 10 and I'm sure that even by then the red fledglings don't like these red fledglings don't turn out to be evil um, spoiler alerts guys there's a group of them that are but these ones are fine I guess it's just a red herring then isn't it whatever Eric comes back to give a progress report on absolutely nothing good one dickhead the red fledglings introduce themselves a red-headed kid stepped forward okay dying and undying hadn't improved this kid any he was still pudgy and pale with a frizzy ball of carrot colored uncombed hair sticking up in odd places on his head I'm Elliot he said Elliot is still being dunked on five books later because why not a short hispanic guy who looked seriously thuggish with his sagging pants Stevie Ray beamed at yet another blonde, only Gerati wasn't all tall and Barbie-like. She was pretty, but her blonde hair was more dishwater than platinum. I thought Zoe was being bitchy here by saying that someone's hair looked like dishwater, but it turns out that dishwater blonde is a real thing, so we've all learned something today. And last but not least is Chromisha. A black girl twitched 
out of the group. Let's get it straight right now that I'm not sharing my bed with no one, Kromisha said, weaving her head around and looking bored and pissed off at the same time. Why is she so mad, cast duo? Care to explain that one? Venus is low-key flirting with Eric and Zoe notices it and she's a bit jealous, but that's also none of her business anyway, seeing as she's into Stark now and maybe Heath, it depends on what day of the week, and maybe Kelowna. Depends what day of the week it is. Everyone demands to know what the heck a Kelowna is. Last I checked, it's a rabbit cat man video game. Chapter four. So we have PB and J, Bologna, 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 <laughs> and processed American cheese slices. Jack said the processed American cheese slices part like he was reluctantly offering us worms and mud and my personal gourmet chef concoction, mayonnaise, peanut butter, and lettuce on a wheat bread can't you do anything right? I was surprised to see the amount of food and chips and brown pop. Yeah, for brown pop. What? Would you, did you mean yay? Would, yeah, yeah, without even a H on the end. Yeah. Aphrodite recites the prophecy from the last book about Clona to them off by heart. Wow, well done you, Jack said, clapping his hands. This is actually the nicest any of them have ever been to her. Zoe Expo dumps. Watch my last video to find out the lore because, you know, I don't care. They talk about Stark shooting Stevie Ray. He did say your name, Eric said. His piercing blue eyes seemed to see deep inside me. It's not the only thing that's deep inside you. Ugh. I remember that distinctly. Before he shot Stevie Ray, he definitely recognised you. He even said he'd come back to you. I was with him when he died, I said, returning Eric's questioning gaze and trying not to look gu as guilty as I felt for being attracted to yet another guy besides him. OMG, the drama. Stay single. Have a dating cleanse. Look, he had wings. That ain't right, Kramisha added, fragmenting my attention. My mama told me don't trust no white boy, even a pretty one. I'm thinking a pretty white boy with wings exploding up from the ground and a mess of blood and ugly ass bird things is double trouble. Okay, so firstly, Clona is not a white boy. He's a cat man. No, but really, Kelowna in this comes from Native American legend and lore. So I would assume that means he's actually Native American, right? So he's not going to be white then, is he? He's going to be Native American. Except he was Nyx's consort before, but Nyx is clearly like a Greek goddess, isn't, isn't she? So is he Greek? I don't know, but I don't think that he's a white boy. I'm confused. I think the cast duo are as well. I think they're forgetting the law already. Majorly, Erin said. She looked at Shawnee. Her twin nodded, so she continued. He would have gotten to us too. If Aphrodite hadn't been shrieking unattractively at us to keep the circle together, we'd still be back in the middle of that mess, which would not be good, Shawnee said. That's all I'm saying, Kramisha added. Again, I say if members of the nerd herd, Aphrodite slurred, because she's drinking, not because she's slurring, as in doing slurs. You get my point. Even Zoe felt the urge to go to Kelowna, brackets, I think, maybe check. CBA though, good one. Yeah, but she did, didn't she? She felt the draw to him. So yet again, everyone owes their lives to Aphrodite because she feels nothing towards Kelowna. Not that I'm trying to be mean, but this bed and your tables and fridges and other things are a serious improvement over the dirty rags and other grossness I saw down here a month or so ago. She gave me her cute Stevie Ray smile and said, that's mostly thanks to Aphrodite. She bought this stuff. Actually, it was her idea, Stevie Ray said. Aphrodite is literally out there doing charity work for all of these people and all they do is either bitch about her or bitch to her. Chapter six, that's it. I'm cutting you off, I told Aphrodite as the red fledglings erupted into laughter. Aphrodite, she crazy even when she's not drunk and imprinted, Kermisha said. We all used to her though. <sighs> Let her get drunk and enjoy being human again, please. I would go back on my sobriety, four years, four plus years, so quickly if I was stuck on this story too. That's not right. They ain't nasty and abandoned, Commissioner spoke up, frowning at Aphrodite. We're here and we've been decorating. You should know, because we used your got to no limit gold card to buy the stuff. Did you use incorrect grammar at the same time like you are now? Aphrodite said as she peered blurrily at Kromisha from around Darius. Look, I know you human and just been awkwardly imprinted with Stevie Ray, not to mention you getting totally trashed. I'm having a hard time with this. So I'd hate to use my superior red fledgling skills to kick your bony ass, but if you talk about me again, I'm going to forget to be nice, Kromisha said. Aphrodite, stop paying for everyone. Stop giving people money and freebies. Just stop. Because it don't make people be nice to you. It really doesn't. Don't bother. Fuck them. <laughs> See how far they would get without Aphrodite's 
Humanity and money. See how far. Jack and I will take the first shift guarding the sealed off entrance to the downtown tunnels, Damien said. That is, if it's okay with you guys. Yeah, we could even plan some menus and write down some things we need for the kitchen, Jack said. Oh, and I wonder who's going to pay for all of that. We are 68 pages into this story at this point, by the way. And nothing has happened except for everyone sitting around talking. Oh, well, yeah, we can do that. I'm cool with protecting a priestess and her group, Johnny B said. I stifled an eye roll. Even without the red fledgling issue, the last thing I needed was another football player-like guy in my life. My eyes slid over to Eric and I had to force myself to not jump guiltily. Yes, he'd been watching me. Great. He'd mostly ignored me since we got into the tunnels and chose the instant when some other guy was flirting with me to stare at me. Please take a dick detox. Please, Zoe. Good question. I turned to Stevie Ray. Where do we sleep? Johnny B spoke up before CB Ray could answer. For the record, I'm willing to share my bed. My heart is more giving than Kramisha's. It ain't your heart you want to share, Kramisha said. Don't go hating on me, baby, Johnny B said, trying unsuccessfully to sound black. And what, pray tell, does that sound like, cast duo? Please tell me. Do you know what's funny, right, about doing these books, right, this, specifically House of Night? I always think, well, as the series went on, surely it got less offensive and maybe there'll be less things for me to make fun of and pick on and maybe no one will enjoy it if there's nothing for me to make fun of and yada, 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 but the inverse has happened. What if the opposite is true? It's just like, it never fails to surprise me and I rub my hands with glee every time I read something offensive in these books. I'm like, oh boy, that's a video for me. That'll pay my bills for the next month. I mean, the whole 1920s flapper thing and duke joints and gangsters. Damien smiled indulgently at Jack. Actually, <laughs> actually, he's like a Reddit mod. Prohibition lasted in Tulsa until 1957. Well, never mind. That's not so romantic. That's more like gay Bible Belt stuff, he giggled. Gay. Hee hee. I think I'm in hell. I'm like that bloke. Sisyphus. 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 But I got that right. I'm the bloke pushing the boulder up and it falls the way back down. I'm like this with all these bloody books because every time I do one of these reviews, 10 more crappy ones pop up. I got that right. Sisyphus. Not the pronunciation, but I know my Greek mythology. No, none of you ever talk to me again. I'm literally too good for YouTube. When am I getting my Netflix special? Why won't anyone from the mainstream notice me? Oh, and I have one more question, Jack said, frowning at Aphrodite. As he started to put his hand up, I said, yes, Jack, what, what, like he's at school putting his hand up, like teacher, teacher, oh. Where, where do we potty? Potty? Did he really just say potty? Aphrodite giggled until she snorted. We ignored her. Why is everyone ignoring her? That's a valid thing to point out. So a grown well, not a 17 year old, I think, adult, not adult, teenager, saying potty. Quick, someone check Damien's hard drive because he's clearly dating a child. They have working bathrooms in the depot building up above. A guy called Dallas keeps flirting with Stevie Ray. Considering that, spoiler alert, Stevie Ray gets with a bird man later on. Yeah, that happens. I actually completely forgot that Dallas even existed. Imagine dating someone and then they they leave you for a bird man monster. <laughs> that would hurt. That would bruise the ego, would it? Almost everyone leaves. Before he ducked under the blanket, Darius spoke over his shoulder to Eric, who I'd almost forgotten was still lingering in the room. Almost. He's, Eric is always hanging around like a bad smell. Well, if you need me, simply have a fledgling. The warrior's sentence was cut off as Aphrodite jerked hard enough on his hand to pull him away from the room. Then she stuck her head back through the doorway. Good effing night. Don't bother us. And she disappeared. And there goes the greatest character this book has ever known. Chapter seven. Okay, special note. Who are you talking to? Stop talking to me. Never speak to me again. Don't, in fact, if you're going to talk to me, don't look me in the eyes, right? Avert your gaze when you speak. To if I'm ever uber, uber famous, you know, like a, like a actor, singer, not dancer, never going to learn to do that. Writing, documentarian, extraordinaire person, com oh, comedian as well. Yeah, chuck that in there. When I'm like the biggest deal that this pathetic little country has ever seen and people want to come meet me at meet and greets one of the rules is going to be that you're not allowed to look me directly in the eyes right because you have to bow down to me as the alpha i'm gonna stop zoe and eric take the opportunity to walk alone together he stopped and touched my arm gently turning me so that i faced him 
that was terrible pronunciation. I looked up into his brilliant blue eyes, which were framed by his adult vampire mark, an intricate pattern that gave the impression of a mask, making his totally gorgeous Clark Kent Superman look go all Zorro-like and insanely hot. That's a long sentence, dude. But Eric was more than just super gorgeous. Eric was talented and an honestly nice guy. Yeah, nice TM guy. I hated that we had broken up. I hated that I caused us to break up. In spite of everything that had happened, I wanted to be his girlfriend again. I wanted him to trust me again i missed him so darn much considering it's the end of the world as you know it and i feel fine maybe don't jump into making emotional decisions based upon your burning loins he cupped my face into his hands i couldn't be fooled by neferet or hypnotized by Kelowna because I'm already a fool for you, hypnotized by what I feel for you. I still want to be with you, Zoe, if you'll just say yes. Yes, I whispered without one instant of hesitation. Oh shit, I said here, I swear that they don't even last a week. I'll do something if they even last until the end of this book. They do last until the end of this book, so... What should I do? I was going to do this anyway. This ties in quite nicely. I'm brilliant. I was going to do this anyway because there is a charity. This video is not sponsored by anyone. It's certainly not sponsored by this charity. They have no idea I exist, but there is a charity that I donate. I have a monthly direct debit to called sense.org.uk, which is a charity that helps thousands of people who are deaf, blind, or have complex disabilities, helps them communicate, experience the world. Not only do they help out people who have these disabilities, they help out parents and carers and siblings. So, so I thought of doing this, but I didn't write it down. I was going to say something like, do you know what? If they last a, if they last the entire book, then I will donate some, I, I already do a monthly direct debit, but I'll do a one-off donation of a hundred quid if they last the entire book. And they did, they did last the entire book. So I'm going to do that right now. And if you also want to help out deaf blind people, people with complex disabilities, then check out sense.org.uk. This is not sponsored. I'm not an affiliate or anything like that. I just think it's an important charity. Oh my God, some good actually just came out of this stupid book series. Who would have thunk it? Would I would have never believed it. They kiss. Then he kissed me again and I swear he made me dizzy. It was different than kissing him before, before he'd become a full vampire, before I'd lost my virginity to another man. Now it was like he knew a secret, but I was in on it. I felt his moan more than I heard it. And then I also felt the hard coolness of the wall of the tunnel against my back as he turned me in his arms and trapped me there. One of his hands low on my back was firmly pressing me into him. The other I felt sliding down the side of my body, skimming my ceremonial dress and traveling down the back of my thigh until he found the hem. Then his fingers were finding their way up and under it warm against the coolness of my naked flesh naked flesh backed against the wall of a tunnel being groped in the dark and the worst thought of all hit me did eric think because i'd had sex once that now it was open season on nailing zoe ah crap i wasn't gonna do this not here not like this not like this matrix i'm i'm such a michael scott aren't i <laughs> Hell, I didn't even know if I was ready to do it again at all. The one and only time I'd had sex had ended disastrously and had been the biggest mistake of my life. It definitely not turned me into some kind of nympho ho. See, this this bit is is kind of good because it's making it's making a point. Didn't write any down, so I'm just improv in here. I'm just spitballing. I'm just throwing seeds and seeing what you know plants. Um, seeing what grows. It's making some sort of point. Rachel, can you think of any point to this? Because I sure can't. <laughs> it's making a point about how, like, you know, I guess she's had sex, but then that doesn't mean that Eric is owed sex. So maybe it's making that kind of point, right? Up until the end where it says, I'm not some sort of hoe. I'm not a slut, not like those other sluts. <sighs> It's like, it tries so hard to, you know, be feminist or whatever, and then it just always goes wrong. I pushed against Eric's chest and pulled my mouth from his. He didn't seem to mind. Actually, he hardly seemed to notice. He just kept grinding against me and moved his lips to my neck. Eric, please stop, I said breathlessly. Um, you taste so good. Ah. He sounded so sexy and turned on for that. For a moment, I was confused about what I really wanted. I mean, I did want to be with him again, and he was totally hot and familiar, and... So Eric the woman hater becomes Eric the sex pest. This is his character development. Luckily, they are interrupted by some scary shadows and then Kramisha appears. As in the shadows become one of the antagonists later on. I'm not kidding you. This is Kramisha's dialogue. Boy, four wise. You is working it here in the tunnel. Damn, you got some game. Mm. No problem, we'd be glad to help, I said, regaining my voice and feeling like a moron for letting bats in a dark tunnel almost scared the 
poopy out of me. Yeesh, I must really need some sleep. How embarrassing. Grimisha shows them her room. She likes to read things like Jane Eyre and a book called The Silver Metal Lover by Tanif Lee. There was also a hardback edition of Dragonflight by Anne McCarthy lying beside Thuggalicious, Candy Liquor and G-Spot by an author whose name was blazed as Noir. Mm -hmm. I googled that. Those are like real <laughs> books. Kramisha writes poetry, so they check it out. Shadows in shadows, he watches through dreams. Wings black as Africa, body strong as stone. Done waiting, the ravens call. Yep, she's also a very gifted fledgling and she doesn't even know it yet. Chapter eight. All of her recent poems are about Kelowna. What a coincidence. I think she's vamp poet laureate material and a major improvement over our last one. Eric said. Of course she is. Everyone that Zoe is okay with has to be special too like this world would be so easy to cheat code if you ended up in it somehow just be in proximity to zoe and bam you'll get a special power you'll be special okay even though it made me uncomfortable to think about lauren especially when eric had been the one to bring him up i felt the rightness of what he was saying down deep in my gut which said more about kramisha's true nature than what my exhausted guessing and my apparently overactive imagination were telling me nix obviously had her hand on this kid what the hell i'm the only high priestess we have i can make a proclamation kramisha i'm going to make you our first poet laureate just like that um I agree and everything with you Z, but doesn't the council have to vote on a new poet laureate, Jack said. Yep, and I had my council down here with me. I realised Jack had been talking about the council of Nyx, the one Shekinah had been the head of that ruled all vampires, but I had a council also. A prefect council, yeah, because that's the same thing. Acknowledged by the school, ooh. Made up of me, Eric, the twins, Damien, Aphrodite and Stevie Ray. Kramisha has my vote, Eric said. See, it's practically official, I said. Yeah, Jack cheered. Are you sure you don't mean yay, guys? Not yet. Yeah. Also, some democracy. I decided quickly it must have been the depot ticket office. From there, we entered a huge room. The floor was marble and it still looked slick and butter-like in the dimness. The walls were weird though. All kind of rough and bare from the floor up to about a foot or so above my head. And then the decoration started. They were blurred by dust and time and inattention. And there were cobwebs hanging all over. Yeesh. First bats and now spiders. It, I gazed around at the corroded beauty and thought this could make a great school. It was big and it had the same kind of grace as many of Tulsa's downtown buildings had. Thanks to the oil boom and the 1920s art deco styling. Lost in thought of what might someday be. Zoe does not talk like that. She does not talk like this. She talks like, eesh, bats, spiders, bears, oh my. That's how she talks, not, oh, what might someday be? She doesn't. I started to turn away and Eric's touch of my arm stopped me. Hey, we're together again, aren't we? I met Eric's eyes and saw his vulnerability through the pretend confidence of his smile. He wouldn't understand if I said I needed to talk to him about, well, sex before I agreed to get back together with him. That would hurt his ego as well as his heart and then I'll be back to where I was before with me kicking myself for being the cause of us being apart. Who cares about his ego? He is not owed sex just because you lost your virginity and yet it is important to talk about these things because otherwise people run on presumptions and then presumptions make an ass out of you and me. Is it presumptions? Presuming? I don't know assuming assuming ass i stood there for a while just looking at the closed door and thinking had i been wrong about the change in eric had i misunderstood what was behind his passion in the tunnel after all he wasn't a fledgling anymore he was a fully changed adult vampire that made him a man even though he was still 19. just like he'd been less than a week ago before he changed maybe the increase in the sexual tension between us was natural are you really going down the oh well he's a man so his biology he can't help it shut up and not just because he thought i was a skank now that I'd given up my virginity. Eric was a man. What in the self-hate is this? The sex thing would work itself out. I mean, it won't, because you have to talk about these things. I mean, compared to an ancient immortal coming after us, Nefere having the scorn in her evil clutches, me freaking out about whether there is or isn't something bizarre going on with the red fledglings, grandma being in a coma, and the nasty raven mockers wreaking havoc in Tulsa, whether or not Eric would try to pressure me into having sex with him should be a stress break, or at least a stress vacation. Shouldn't it? Chapter nine. The girls shower together. So it was awkward to be naked with my friends at first, but we are all girls, hetero girls at that. So we weren't really interested in each other's boobies and such, no matter how hard that is for guys to comprehend. I don't know where I asked for any of that. Shawnee and Erin are manipulating the water to make sh the showers nicer. And we are given this insufferable exchange. Would we do that twin? Erin asked. We absolutely would twin. 
Shawnee said. For shame, twin. For shame. Take a shot every time they say twin. Oh wait, no, don't, because you will die and I'll get sued for being irresponsible. So here's where the interesting part came in. I decided that there was not one darn thing wrong with the twins using their gifts to make us feel warm and clean and comfy. I don't understand why Zoe keeps like put, making a huge deal out of this because it's fine to use your own powers for a bit of pampering. Literally, who cares? Like if you were cold and you had the power to harness fire, are you sure you can make a fire to keep yourself warm? What's the big deal? Who cares? Is this trying to meet a word count? Who knows? They have a water fight. Of course they couldn't win. I mean, come on. I can call on all of the five elements, but it was a hilarious version of a pillow fight slash water fight that left all of us drenched and breathless with laughter. Didn't the beginning of this chapter open with, um, we aren't interested in being naked and stereotypical, unlike what boys think. And then you just did the stereotypical equivalent of a pillow fight. BFFR. <sighs> Then the three of us drifted back down to the tunnels, ignoring the crack and boom show that was playing outside, securing the fact that we were surrounded by the earth and protected by male vampires who would no way let anyone sneak up on us. Some matriarchy, like in this series, they really pat themselves on the back with being like, you know, the vampire society is a matriarchal one because all the women are the leaders and make the decisions, except all the men are warriors and the women have traditionally more feminine magical roles like being healers and you know what I mean I don't need to explain myself the big man folk are the warriors and then the women are like tee hee we're gonna heal and we're gonna do a bit of spell casting do you know what I mean so it's not really breaking any, any gender norms in fantasy there is it so he goes to bed then I'd had the horrible dream which brought me back to the current time 100 pages and 25% later and we are finally at the present of which the plot is taking place that is ridiculous at this point harry potter would already be at school getting up to no good at this point frodo would maybe be leaving the shire i'm not sure he does sit on having the ring for like 15 or so years don't know how was i supposed to deal with all of this especially when the good guys sometimes seem bad and the bad guys were so so Images of Stark and Kelowna pass through my mind, making me feel terribly confused and stressed out. She has just gotten back together with Eric and it's already like, ooh, Stark, ooh, Kelowna, ooh. The fact that in my nightmare, Kelowna had insisted I was Aya was just crazy. It wasn't true. Sure, I'd felt drawn to it's so fucking bad. It's so bad. It's so like, no, it's not true. However, I'd felt drawn to him, but so had practically everyone else. Plus, I was me and Aya had been, well, dirt until the Higao woman had breathed life and special gifts into her. I must look, I must look like her, weird as that is, I told myself. Or maybe he'd called me Aya just to mess with my head. So guess what? Zoe is Aya. That's right. She's reincarnated from a woman who was made of dirt. <laughs> The cast duo cannot do suspense. There's nothing suspenseful about, I can't be that dead woman from ages ago. I just can't be. Well, I closed the blanket flap quietly, not wanting to wake up the twins before it was their turn to be on watch. Actually, I should grab my brown pop and relieve Damien and Jack and tell them to let the twins sleep. I definitely wouldn't be doing any more sleeping for a while, like years. Okay, just kidding, sort of. So this paragraph goes from past tense to present tense, back to past tense in just like three sentences. It was, is, and will continue to be a mess. Zoe drinks some blood. I know, I know, my slurping down blood like it was from a collapsible juice box sounds completely nasty, but it was delicious. You're a vampire. We've known that you like blood for five books now. There is no need to be self-conscious or justify things anymore. Trust us a bit. There's even more exposition dumping about how she's friends with this nun called Sister Mary Angela. We already know this stuff, it's been covered. I remembered the Dark Angel's voice and the way pain and pleasure had somehow melded into one when he touched me and called me his love. I jerked my mind from those kind of thoughts. Pain couldn't equal pleasure. Wow, the cast really called themselves vanilla, didn't they? Eric appears out of nowhere, as usual, to be a creep because he's a pound shop Edward Cullum. I almost blurted that I was freaked by shadows and unseen crap down in the tunnels, but I could imagine him laughing and accusing me of jumping at bats again. And what if I was just ultra sensitive because of the dream? Did I really want to talk to Eric or anybody about Kelowna right then? No. Half of Zoe's problems stem from not communicating with anyone. Yes, everyone should know that Kelowna is trying to contact Zoe through her dreams. The fact that he even has that ability should be made known so people can be alert. 
And it's revealed later on in this book, actually, that yes, he can do that to anyone if he wants. So the group should know about this. Well, that puts me in good company. Eric chuckled, reaching for a chip while I glanced around the basement. So Eric is the type of person who helps himself to your food. Throw him back down the tunnel. I said, well, yeah, Dracula is supposed to be a monster and all, but I always feel sorry for him. You feel sorry for him? Eric was obviously surprised. Z, he's pure evil. I know, but he loves Mina. How can something that's pure evil know love? Wow, much foreshadowing, very suggestive. I wish Dracula hadn't let everyone come between him and Mina. Sorry, spoiler alert. He should have bitten Mina, made her like him, and then taken her away so they could be together forever and lived happily ever after. Because they're the same and they belong together, he said. I looked up into Eric's amazing blue eyes and saw that all the kidding had gone out of them. Yeah, <laughs> even if bad things happened in their past, they'd have to forgive each other for the bad stuff. But I think they could have. I know they could have. I think when two people care about each other enough, anything can be forgiven. I guarantee they don't even last a week. Obviously, Eric and I weren't talking about fictional characters from an old book. We were talking about ourselves. <laughs> really? Wow, I didn't get that at all. How stupid did the cast do I think we are? Still smiling, Eric bent to kiss me. His lips were warm and soft and he tasted like Doritos and Mountain Dew. <laughs> So he's like a Reddit mod then. So he tastes like he plays World of Warcraft. I managed to tune out the little alarm bells that were ringing in the rational part of my mind as Eric's hands slid down my back to cut my butt. But when he pressed me hard against him, grinding intimately into me, the lovely warm fog he'd started inside me began to clear. I liked him touching me. But what I didn't like was the feeling that his touch had suddenly become too aggressive, too insistent, too, she is mine, I want her and I'm going to have her now. Is there one straight male who is normal in this book. Zoe then immediately gaslights herself that Eric is a good guy and she's just being sensitive. But you know, with Eric, slut is a word that easily drops from his lips whenever he's annoyed, so you might wanna rethink the good guy angle. Then I walked a little ways through the basement, which I noticed wasn't as disgusting now as it had been last time I'd been down here. Stevie Ray and her group had obviously done a lot of cleaning and throwing away of the street people's stuff that had been littering the place before. And happily, it didn't smell like urine anymore. Oh yeah, by the way, the red fledglings were murdering and eating homeless people but no one actually cares about that it's only ever brought up in reference to ew you were eating street people that's nasty that's gross because the insinuation there is it's nasty because they're quote unquote dirty that's the only time it's ever brought up with any semblance of regret, which is very telling about how the authors feel, isn't it? Zoe rings the sister, Mary Angela. The grandma, her grandma, is fine, but the connection dies. Zoe then gets a text saying all the fledglings and vampires must return to the House of Night immediately, and it's clearly from Nefere. Zoe and Eric share a hug just as Heath appears, of course. Chapter 10. Heath. I hurried toward him, practically shouting my relief that it was him and not a terrifying raven mocker or worse, an ancient immortal with eyes like the night sky and a voice like a forbidden secret. Heath? Eric didn't sound nearly as pleased. He grabbed my arm so I couldn't run past him. Stop manhandling her. Oh, I'd say congrats on the makeup with Zerman on not drowning in your own blood, but that would pretty much be bullshit because I wouldn't mean it. Know what I mean, dude? He talked as he walked around Eric to snag my wrist, but before he could pull me into a big hug, he glanced down and saw new tattoos covering my palms. They all manhandle her. Heath pulls her into a hug and she's all, mmm, his blood calls to me. Like, give it a rest for five minutes, babe. But I needed to see for myself. Plus, I wanted to ask what the fuck about the weird call last night. Cool, Eric said. His eyes were guarded when he looked at me. Yes, cool. I lifted my chin. Eric might be my boyfriend again, but no way was I going to put up with his all being possessive and insanely jealous. It's currently the end of the known world and Eric wants to get shitty about Zoe calling Heath to warn him that it's the end of the world. Like, she cares about Heath. She wanted to warn him that there are bird men flying around killing people and Eric wants to get shitty about that put him in the bin the thought flitted through my mind that maybe eric wouldn't ever be able to really trust me after what happened between us and i'd have to put up with some obsessive jealousy i'd kind of earned it okay real talk right real relationship advice with elise yeezy if you're in a relationship and someone cheats but you decide to work through it and stay together you have to forgive them completely for it and learn to trust them again Otherwise, just break up because you're just going to be torturing yourself and torturing them. If you're torturing someone that you're in close proximity to all the time, then you're just going to be hurting yourself, you know? So 
I know that if I was in a relationship with someone and they cheated, I wouldn't be able to trust them ever again. That's it. That's like a hard boundary for me. So I just wouldn't get back together with them. Don't care, mate. Cut them off. It's kind of that simple. But then people always say, oh, well, what if you have kids involved? Well, do you want your children thinking that you can treat someone like crap in a relationship and it's fine because the other person will just like forgive them, get back together with them or it's a toxic mess. Anyway, Zoe tells Heath what the Raven mockers are. You really think it's a good idea to tell him all that? Eric said, hey, why don't you let Zoe decide what she wants to tell me and what she doesn't want to tell me? Heath puffed up like he was dying to take a swing at Eric. Eric puffed right back at him. You're a human, he said the word like it was an STD. You can't handle the same things we can handle. Try remembering that I had to save your stupid human ass from a bunch of vampire ghosts just a couple months ago. Zoe saved me, not you. And I've been handling Zoe for about a zillion years longer than you've even known her. Yeah, how often has your stupid human ass put her in danger since she's been marked? They are both a pair of annoying brats. Dump them. Keith brought a gun. Fair enough, I guess. And then nothing comes of the gun. So like, what is the point? Chekhov's gun. Like that's not, whatever. The Raven Mocker disruption in Tulsa is being blamed on gang violence in the news. He has wings, big black ones, Eric said, but he's not a good guy. And everything we know about him says he's always been evil. No, he hasn't. Okay, my mouth said that, but I really hadn't meant it to. One dream and she is a Kelowna simp. This one is for all of the I can fix him girlies. What the hell was the matter with me? I knew better than just about anyone how evil Kelowna was. I'd felt his dark power. I knew Neferet was all mixed up with him. So mixed up with him that she decided to turn her back on Nyx. Okay, all of that definitely spelt out E-V-I-L. Are you? F-I-V-E. Not me having to remember how to spell five. Neferet is manipulating the press with the fake gang reports. The less he knows, the better it is for him, Eric insisted. No, see, that's what I thought before. And that's why everyone was so mad at me. That's also why I made some major mistakes. I looked from Eric to Heath. If I hadn't kept so many secrets and had trusted my friends to handle themselves, I might have talked more and messed up less. Wait, what? Is this self-reflection? Is this character development in my House of Night series? Well, I never. They tell Heath to go home before the sun goes down. People say male vamps are big into protecting their priestesses. Is that right? So matriarchal. That's right, Eric said. Good, then I expect you to be sure Zoe stays safe. Nothing's going to happen to her as long as I'm alive, Eric said. Make sure it doesn't. Heath's voice had lost the charming, easygoing tone with which he usually spoke. It had gone hard and dangerous because if you let anything happen to her, I'm going to find you. And vampire or no vampire, I am going to kick your ass. Zoe doesn't need Eric. He doesn't even have one elemental affinity. She has all five. She literally doesn't need any bloke ever. Chapter 11, I smacked their chests. That made them blink and shift their attention to me. Now it was my turn to do the glaring. You know, you two are ridiculous with your puffing up and your testosterone and crap. I mean, I could summon the elements and kick both of your butts. See, see, you tell them. But first, I, this is Heath. I really do need to talk to you, Zoe, alone. I'm not going anywhere, Eric said. No one asked you to, Heath said. Zoe, would you come outside of me for a minute? Hell no, Eric said, moving towards me possessively. She's not going anywhere with you. I was frowning up at Eric, about to tell him that he really wasn't the boss of me, when he did something that totally, utterly and completely pissed me off. He actually grabbed my wrist and jerked me towards him, even though I hadn't taken one step to follow Heath. An automatic reflex had me yanking my wrist from his grasp. His blue eyes narrowed at me. At that instant, he looked mad and mean and seemed more a stranger than a boyfriend. He is insane. You're not going anywhere with him, he repeated to me. My temper spiked. I cannot stand being bullied. So thankfully, Zoe does stand up for herself. Instead, all I did was shake my head and say in my coldest voice, Eric, enough. Just because we're back together doesn't mean you can tell me what to do. How about does it mean that you don't cheat on me again with your human boyfriend, Eric snapped. I gasped and took a step back from him like he slapped me. Why the hell do you think you can talk to me like that? My stomach clenched up so hard I thought I was going to be sick, but I ignored it. Meeting Eric's angry glare with a steely stare of my own. As your girlfriend, you've just pissed me off. As your high priestess, you've just insulted me. And as someone with a working brain, oh my god, I like I could hear the cast duo being like, oh my god, we're so... Like that. I can hear them being like... I don't know what the word, the official word is for that. Like when you're being like, when you're being like that, like what's the word for that? No idea. And as someone with a working brain, you've made me wonder if you've lost every bit of your sense. What do you think I'm going to do in the minute or so I'd be alone with Heath standing outside in the parking lot during an ice storm? Lie down and let him do me right there in the cement? Is that really the kind of girl you think I am? 
Eric didn't say anything. He just kept glaring at me. Dump him. She goes outside to talk to Heath about Eric. Heath is worried about Zoe being away from the school. Slowly, without saying a word, Heath took my hand and turned it over so that he could look at the intricate tattoos that decorated it. He traced the pattern with one of his fingers. So two things can be true at once. Eric is a massive asshole and Zoe has difficulty establishing boundaries with the men in her life. Last time I saw you, I said that it hurt too much to love you, but I was wrong about that. The truth is, it hurts too much not to love you, Heath said. Heath, no, we can't. My voice was rough. Oh, Heath, no, we can't. My voice was rough as I tried to talk through the desire I was feeling for him. She's been back with Eric for less than one day. Eric is a total piece of shit, but why even bother being in a monogamous relationship when you fancy 10 different guys at once? Behave, keep it in your pants. Heath presses Zoe's nail against his neck and cuts himself, but Zoe stops herself from drinking and imprinting again because she's worried about damaging his soul. Where the fuck did that come from? Like, it's so random. I don't think they've ever even mentioned souls, apart from like spirit, but they've never. So why is she worried about, huh? Worry about your own soul, babe. Maybe you're just making it too complicated. There's you, there's me. We love each other and we have ever since we were kids. So we should be together. The end, he said. Why are all these men in these books so pushy? Zoe storms off, but here's a raven mocker. Then the image shifted, changed. I gasped as it became more visible. Neferet. She was clinging to a thick ice slick branch that leaned against the roof of the depot. <laughs> her eyes blazed crimson and her hair whipped around her crazily, like she'd been caught in a sudden wind. Neferet smiled at me. Her expression was so purely evil that I felt frozen in place. Then, as I stared up in horror, her image shifted again, wavered, and where the image of the tainted high priestess had been, there was now a huge raven mocker. So this is now a thing that Neferet can do, apparently. My father will be very pleased when I pres sent you to him. The mocker hissed, spreading his wings as if he was preparing to fly down and snatch me up. I'll have to say hell no to that little messed up plan of yours, Heath yelled. How do these characters always have the time to say like these snappy lines in tense situations? It's not a Marvel movie. It's not Spider-Man. Chapter 12. Heath shoots at the Raven mocker because he's an all-American boy but misses. The raven mocker attacks, but Zoe jumps in the way and gets sliced up instead. Zoe then sets the raven mocker on fire. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boy. Zoe is dying right now, but shit, he said, and his face turned really pale. Without saying another word, Eric ripped off his shirt, which was the cool black long sleeved polo he'd been wearing at our last ritual. It really takes you out of the moment to describe clothes and clothes being cool when you're meant to be at death's door. DiCaprio, I whispered, irritated at the fact that after all these years, Heath was still jealous that when I was a kid, I'd had a crush on Leonardo, or as I like to think of him, my boyfriend, Leo. A kid, huh? Sounds like you would have been DiCaprio's type. Darius takes Zoe to fix her up, everyone else being useless, and Cremisha wants to eat Heath, but then gets told to leave. It was then that Aphrodite slapped the doorway blanket aside and made her grand entrance. Looking seriously like poopy, she scowled at the room. Bro is dying and is taking what is possibly her final moments and thoughts to dunk on Aphrodite in true House of Night style. Chapter 13. Damien... <laughs> Damien, Jack and Eric ran into the room, followed closely by Duchess. Jack took one look at me, screamed like a girl and fainted. So when I read that initially, that legitimately made me laugh out loud. Like, is he a damsel from a 50s black and white film who accidentally saw a man flash an ankle? Why? It's so unnecessary. They need to cast a circle and focus the healing powers of the elements on Zoe. Darius told Aphrodite. She nodded, touched my forehead gently, then started snapping commands at my friends. Nerd her, take your places. Let's get this circle cast. They would all be dead if it wasn't for Aphrodite. Dead. Eric took the hand Stevie Ray had let loose. I'm here, Z. He threaded his fingers with mine. You have to make it through this. We need you. He paused and his beautiful eyes met mine. I need you. And I'm sorry about all that stuff before. Then Heath raised my other hand to his lips, kissing it softly. Hey, Zoe, did I tell you I haven't had one drink for more than two months? She's dying and it is still a dick swinging contest of who loves Zoe the most. Anyway, the cast duo go full Stephen King. I made the mistake of glancing down. Maybe it was a good thing that I didn't have the energy to scream. There was a long laceration that went all the way from the top of my left shoulder, across my chest a couple of inches above my breast, and didn't end until it sliced through the skin on my right shoulder. The cut was deep and jagged. The edges of my skin flapped sickeningly apart, showing way more muscle and fat and layers of skin than I was ever meant to see. Blood seeped from all along the terrible wound, but not as much blood as I would expect. Was that because I was running out of it? Hell, it was probably because I was running out. My breast started to come in hysterical little pants. 
Mmm, flappy skin. <laughs> Get that circle cast, Darius said. We're ready, Damien said. I looked around, definitely avoiding glancing down at myself again to see that Damien, Stevie Ray and the twins had taken their position in a circle around us. Then get it cast, Darius snapped. There was a pause into which Erin finally spoke, but Zoe always casts the circles. We never have. I'll do it. Aphrodite stepped within the circle and marched over to Damien. Damien gave her a look that I could see was filled with doubt. You don't have to be a fledgling or a vampire to cast a circle. All you have to be is attached to Nyx, and I'm attached to Nyx, she said firmly. But I need you guys to be behind me on this. Are you? See, they are so useless about Aphrodite. They're like lost little lambs. Also, it's really funny to me that the answer to every issue, every problem in this book is cast a circle failing exam cast a circle boyfriend dumped you cast a circle accidentally step on some lego cast a circle i couldn't answer him my head felt really light but the rest of my body was unbelievably heavy like some moron had parked a mac truck on top of me she's being a bitch until the very end we love to see it spoiler alert obviously she doesn't die calm down everyone don't get your hopes up zoe drinks heath's blood because of course gotta force that imprint back between the two somehow see i know i wasn't just causing him to feel the exquisite pleasure feeding from a human usually caused both vampire and victim we'd instantly imprinted again even in the bad shape i was in i could tell that heath's whole awareness filled me along with his blood and we were bound together through the magical fabric that was the need and attraction between humor and vampire stitched together in a single garment of the ancient bond that was an imprint that sounds nothing like zoe heath's blood revitalizes her a stone-faced eric lifted my head out of heath's lap they cucked Eric right in front of him and it is what he deserves. Zoe has stopped dying but needs real medical attention instead of just bandages. Like they literally just like get a band-aid and put it like a big one on and somehow that is good enough. There are no sutures in the kit, Darius said. Can't we get some? Eric asked. I noticed as he spoke he was looking everywhere but me. Zoe is just about to die and now Eric is being your snippy because she was forced in of Heath again to save her life. BFFR. Eric, that's not even why actually I was wrong. You are done almost dying from this particular wound, but if you don't get within a coven of vampires, and I mean more than one or two or three of us, the damage caused to your body will use up your reserves of strength and you will begin rejecting the change. Darius paused, letting what he was saying sink in with all of us. You'll die from that. You may come back to us like Stevie Ray and the rest of the Red Fledglings, but you may not. So this means she has to go back to the House of Night where Neferit and Kelowna are, all because she was so stupid that she went outside when it would just have been like the easiest thing in the world to stay put underground she can't even do that and actually nix wouldn't let her reject the change simply wouldn't happen plot hole chapter 13 chapter 14 didn't i fucking tell you aphrodite practically snarled at heath what happened was your fault you shouldn't have been here aphrodite is furious with heath because i frowned at her what's the deal aphrodite when she didn't say anything stevie ray sighed and said because she's nurtle vision girl and this time she was in the dark do not tap into my mind like that, Aphrodite shouted at Stevie Ray. I've got a big wall of text here, so I'm just going to say it straight from the script. They are linked because of the imprint, but this is a complete violation of Aphrodite's privacy just to convenient Zoe in this moment. Everyone deserves the privacy of... Look at me getting on my high horse, on my soapbox. Like, no one's arguing me, I don't think. Everyone deserves the privacy of their own mind. So for someone to be able to forcibly take your private thoughts and speak them aloud without your consent is actually a horrifying concept and especially like especially when you consider that thoughts are spontaneous you can kind of guide where your thoughts go but you actually can't control them initially they just spontaneously come into your into your mind right imagine someone just had like a connection into that they could hear all the mental stuff that you think before you admonish yourself for like being mean or whatever but of course this concept wouldn't be taken seriously in this book and of course not with this particular character because even though all of them would be dead without aphrodite even though all of them are benefiting from her money and essentially her charity. Like they would all be brainwashed and like killed by Kelowna right now if it wasn't for her. Stevie Ray would be dead. Stevie Ray would still be like an out of control red fledgling if it wasn't for her. And she'd be dead. Zoe would be dead. They'd all be dead without her. They've all benefited from her being around. But even like despite all of that, clearly she doesn't deserve having the slightest bit of privacy in her own consciousness. Can you tell that I hate this and I also hate Stevie Ray's character for, do for doing this? It's like such a throwaway little thing, but it really irked me. Imagine having an imprint against your will, then imagine not being able to trust that your thoughts aren't being listened to and are going to stay in your own head. It's such a throwaway concept and I hate it so much. She frowned at Heath and shook her head in disgust. I mean, come on. Are you special needs? I don't even actually want to include that because like that is so offensive, but I have to because that's the point of these. 
Zoe decides to go back to the house tonight and Neferet will have to heal her because Neferet is a healer. Uh, Zoe, Damien said, you sound like you think you're going back there alone. You're not. Yeah, no way, Erin said. We're not letting you out of our sight, Shawnee said. Where you go, we go, Jack said. Yeah, and what the hell is Jack gonna do? Scream again and faint more. He's as useful as a chocolate teapot. Eric's voice sliced between us. We can't all go back with her. Look, Eric, Aphrodite sneered. We get that you're Mr. Jealous and seeing your girlfriend sucking on another guy is probably not cool with you, but you're just going to have to learn to deal. Eric ignored her. Instead, he met my eyes and I saw that he had once again reached into his acting bag of tricks and pulled out the, strain the character of a stranger. As I studied him, I saw absolutely no trace of the guy who wanted me so bad that his passion had gotten kind of scary. I couldn't even find any trace of the possessive Neanderthal who had wanted to kick Heath's butt and boss me around. He was able to cover all of those versions of himself and his emotions so effectively that I was beginning to wonder who the hell the real Eric was. Dump him. Aphrodite, the other idiots and Zoe decide to go back to the house tonight while Stevie, Ray, Eric, Jack and Heath will stay behind. Dude, you don't have shit to say about it. Anyway, I'm not staying. I'm going with Zoe. You can't, Heath. It's way too dangerous, I said. Aphrodite's human and she can go. So can I, he said stubbornly. Why is he so IQ deficient? He's never been a vampire, so why would they let him into a vampire school? She sends Heath home. Anytime, Zoe. And I mean that. Anytime. Then, like we were alone and not in the middle of a room with my friends and boyfriend gawking at us, Heath bent and kissed me. He tastes like Doritos and brown poppin'. Why is everyone tasted like Doritos in this book? This is like... Awful advertising for Doritos. Brown pop and heath. Through it all, I could smell him, the distinct scent of his blood that was imprinted uniquely to me. And because of that, literally the most fascinating, delicious smell on this earth. I love you, babe, he whispered. He kissed me one more time. As he was leaving, he waved at my friends. See you guys around, he said. I was only half surprised when Jack and Damien called by and the twins made kissing noises at him. I mean, heath is cute. Totally cute. Right before he ducked out the blanket door, he glanced at Eric, who was standing beside me. Hey, dude, I'm holding you personally responsible if anything hurts her. In what universe would a supposedly current boyfriend put up with all of this? It's so embarrassing for him. Eric literally is a cuck. Chapter 15. Aphrodite wrapped the ace bandage around me. I wondered what the hell I was going to do about Eric and Heath. Eric and I were supposedly back together, but after the scene in the basement, I wasn't 100% sure that we should be together. I mean, he said he loved me, which is all well and good, but did loving me mean he'd turn all possessive and jerkish? And besides that, was what we had together strong enough to tolerate another imprint with Heath, especially now that it wasn't just an abstract idea? Now that he'd seen Heath and me together, was there any way Eric and I could be together? You only like him because he's hot, dump him. She keeps moaning about the Eric Heath situation as if she doesn't have more important things to think of, like, oh, I don't know, not dying. Maybe this is why you shouldn't leave the fate of the entire world in the hands of a teenager. My mind understands that, but my heart says something else, Jack said, leaning his head against Damien's shoulder. It's just, just. Jack took a deep breath and finished on a sob. It's just poop that I can't go. Are you five? Check the hard drive. I'm going to find my cat, Aphrodite said. I'll see if I can find your or little orange creature too. Aphrodite is literally Zoe's assistant. Why? She should be the main character. Eric is upset and blaming himself for the whole ordeal. If I hadn't been such a possessive asshole in the basement, you wouldn't have gone outside with Heath. You were sending him away, but I had to push things and piss you off. So you went out there with him. He ran his hand for his thick, dark hair. It's just that Heath makes me so damn jealous. He's known you two since you were kids. I just, he hesitated, his jaws clenched and unclenched. I just didn't want to lose you again. So I acted like a jerk. I'm not only did you almost die but i lost you again so naturally zoe's gonna forgive him like just like that instead i just said he's not my boyfriend he's the human i've imprinted with there's a difference consort eric said bitterly it's called being the high priestess's human consort many of them have one often they have more than one so zoe had no idea that this was even a thing but eric did know about this so maybe don't get involved with a high priestess in training then. It's like trying to date a polyamorous person when you're monogamous. It's just not going to work. He's doing it just to, like, he, he loves the drama, I think. He just wants drama. Mate, he said quietly. All right, mate, cheers. If he's a human who has imprinted of a high priestess, he's called her consort. If he's a vampire, he's given the title of the high priestess's mate. And no, it doesn't mean she can't have both. That seemed like good news to me. Clearly it wasn't such good news to Eric, but at least I was beginning to believe other priestesses had gone through this kind of boyfriend stress before. Dump him. They kiss and Eric, of course they kiss. And Heath comes back to witness this because of course he does. 
I recognised the tone I'd only heard in his voice a very few times. He was seriously pissed, but he was also hurt. The last time he'd sounded like this had been when he told me I'd killed part of his soul when I'd had sex... Oh, that's where the soul thing come, came from then. When I'd had sex with Lauren and broken our imprint. Hey, carry on. Pretend I'm not here, just like you were doing before. Didn't mean to interrupt you two. All of these men are so manipulative and the worst. Zoe needs zero boyfriends, not several. Heath, that's not how I think of you, I said. Yeah, well, I don't want to say shit more about it. I'm your blood donor and that's it. He turned away from me and I saw him grab a bottle of wine someone had left by the bed and take a big swig of it. So he's been imprinted for all of five seconds and he started drinking again from the stress. Being around Zoe is a health hazard. Kramisha has written more poems. I don't care about any of that. I don't know poetry. I'm not Rachel Oates. They all officially vote on her being the poet laureate. They think the second poem is about Stark rising from the dead. I love that I just didn't include any of the poems because I'm not putting up with it. I think you should start by paying special attention to Stark, Damien said. Or at least she should be on her guard around him, Eric said. The poem does mention being cut and right now that's way more than a poetic metaphor. I listened while Damien semi-agreed with him and I looked away from Eric's penetrating gaze and right into Hugh's sad brown eyes. Let me guess, Stark's another guy, isn't he? <laughs> Get wrecked. Yeah, I knew stuff about him no one else knew except Neferet and the professors, I said, trying not to watch Heath guzzle down the bottle of wine and avoiding Eric's sharp gaze. I didn't know about this, his gift, and I'm a professor, Eric said. Well, let's see. A not-so-wild guest says that Stark told Z about his gift because she's a top shit fledgling and he wanted her to know the real deal with him. Aphrodite broke him. Can't you see you're wearing the hell out of her of all these questions? Why is Aphrodite the only one who truly cares about what Zoe's well-being? And also, Aphrodite, again, just getting her out of trouble with her boyfriend and like technically human boyfriend just getting her out of trouble it seemed that once again i found myself in a situation that involved three guys and that wasn't even counting Kelowna. and proms tomorrow chapter 16 they all make to leave and they want zoe to feed from heath one last time he looked down at me and i saw several emotions cross his expressive face the foremost of which was a terrible sadness in a voice that sounded almost as weary as i felt he said there's nothing i'm not willing to give you zoe when are you going to understand that i'm wishing you would leave me with a little pride his words broke my heart i love you heath you know that his expression softened into a slight smile. It's good to hear you say it. Then he looked from me to Eric. Did you hear that vamp? She loves me. And remember that no matter how big and bad you think you are, you'll never be able to do this for her. Heath lifted his arm so the bloody slash Eric had made and it was pressed against my lips. Heath, the emotionally manipulative king. Eric literally storms off in a huff. So Zoe feeds but gets slightly drunk because Heath has been drinking. But I feel more right. Or is that writer? Which is it, Damien Shamian? Is this written by people who have never been drunk before? You'd think it was less interesting if you'd eaten a wine and had a hangover headache and then burp cheap wine for days stevie ray said all i can say about that is nasty aphrodite the twins damien jack and i all stared at her finally i was able to say stevie ray please don't eat please don't eat any more people it's really dis dis disturbing i slurred she sure won't eat another wino. That last one tasted bad for real, Kramisha said. Casual murder is fine as long as it's just homeless people because who cares about them? Am I right, cast duo? As they left the room, Eric came back in. Crossing his arms, he leaned silently against the wall and watched me. I used my drunkenness as an excuse to ignore him. Why is the incredible sulk back? Zoe gives Stevie Ray a note saying to be ready to move to Sister Mary Angela's Abbey if Zoe gives the word. They drive back to the house at night. My stomach feels awful, Erin said. I took another deep breath and blinked hard, concentrating on staying conscious. It's Nix. She's warning you of those feelings. Remember the effect Kelowna's parents had on the other fledglings? Aphrodite nodded. Zoe's right. Nix is making us feel crap so we don't give in to the guy. Funny, because I thought Nix believed in free will. Because forcibly making people feel sick so they avoid someone doesn't really feel like free will to me. They go back to the school and find that raven mockers are everywhere and Darius says the sons of Erebus are now their enemies too. They really lucked out that Darius fell in love with Aphrodite and is on their side at least, proving once again that Aphrodite is the saviour of the series and the true main character. Hashtag justice for Aphrodite. Chapter 17. We are officially halfway through. My voice hurts. Slowly and deliberately, Darius shifted his attention from Aristos to the horrible creature who was neither bird nor man, but a mutated mixture of both. 
Creature, I do not know you. The raven mocker narrowed its red eyes at Darius. Son of man, you may call me Rafame. This is Stevie Ray's future boyfriend, bird friend. Why is this series so unhinged? It's like the cast duo heard of the genre monster romance and ran with it. The cast duo walked so Shiggy Shade could run. Of course, Aristus said, all fledglings have been ordered to return to campus. He gestured towards the school buildings. The movement briefly allowed the side of his neck to be illuminated by the nearest gaslight. And I saw a thin red line running across his skin as if his neck had recently been injured. I put this in because I thought maybe it's important, but it's not for the rest of this series, anyway, like this book. Anyway, I don't think it's ever mentioned again. Rafame asks if the red one is with them and Darius is all, I don't know what that is. So Rafame has a shit fit and jumps onto the car and dents it. First of all, rude. Second of all, they call women emotional, hmm? It's like that time in the Bible when Jesus saw a fig tree with no fruit and had a tantrum and cursed it to be barren forever for zero reason or rhyme. It's exactly like that. Rafame calms down and lets them all pass. They see Nefere and suit up with their elements. Kelowna appears and we get treated to this rubbish. He absolutely did not look evil. Kelowna was wearing pants that looked like they were made of the same creamy brown deer skin real mo moccasins, moccasins, mocca whatever shoes were made of. His feet were bare and so was his chest. It sounds stupid to say it, that he was standing there in the hallway half naked, but then it didn't feel stupid at all. It felt right. It's just that he was so incredible. His skin was completely free of any blemish and was the golden tan that white girls try but always failed to get by roasting in tanning beds. His hair was thick and black. It was long, but not ridiculously Fabio long. It was just kind of shaggy and had a cute wave to it. The more I looked at it, the more I could imagine running my fingers through it. Not heeding Aphrodite's warning. I looked directly into his eyes and felt a jolt of electricity sizzle through me as his eyes widened in recognition. And that jolt seemed to zap even more of my already non-existent strength. I sagged in Darius's arms so weak I could hardly hold my head up. Keep it in your pants. This is exactly like that time that Bella kissed Edward and then almost fainted because she forgot to breathe. She is wounded, Kelowna's voice boomed down the hall. Even Nefere cringed. Why is she not being tended? Well, at least someone is trying to get something done around here. Father, I ordered the warrior to take the priestess to the infirmary so that she may be properly cared for. Rafame's unnatural voice sounded even more obscene after hearing the, majest the majesty of Kelowna. Oh, bullshit. Completely shocked, I stared open mouth at Aphrodite, who was giving the raven mocker a best bitchy sneer. She tossed back her thick blonde hair as she continued. Bird boy kept us out there in the freezing rain while he yammered about the red one this and the red one that. Darius got Zoe in here despite his help. Aphrodite air quoted over the word help. There was utter silence in the hallway and then Kelowna threw back his beautiful head and laughed. I had forgotten how amusing human women can be. With a graceful movement of his hand, he gestured to Darius. Bring the young priestess here so that she may be tended. Aphrodite is a better main character than Zoe because she's not intimidated by Kelowna up being hot. She doesn't give a single shit, mate. Nefere tries to kick Aphrodite out because everyone just keeps insisting that she's a human, except what human has visions of the future? Visions? Kelowna's deep voice cut the air between us. This time I refused to look at him, though he was standing so close that I could feel the weird chill that came from his body. What types of visions? Warnings of future disasters? Aphrodite spoke up. Interesting. He drew the word out. Nefere, my queen, you did not tell me you had a prophetess. Prof prophet, shut up at the House of Night. Before Nefere could speak, he continued, most excellent, most excellent, my dude. A prophetess can be quite useful. Kelowna is literally a sexual abuser and he's more likable than Neferet already. I'm sure somehow this proves that the cast duo hate women. Neferet actually pouts to the big raven daddy Kelowna, but he's like, no, I'll do what I want. Fair enough, mate. You stay, little prophetess, Kelowna told Aphrodite. Yes, she said firmly, I do, I stay with Zoe. Okay, I'll freely admit that Aphrodite was utterly surprising me. I mean, yes, I was badly hurt and probably in serious shock. So I can blame my altered mental and physical state on that and hope that some of the weirdly hypnotic effect the fallen angel was having on me was because I very well might be dying. But obviously everyone else was being affected by Kelowna to some degree. Everyone except Aphrodite. She sounded like her normal bitchy self. I just didn't get it. It should be Aphrodite leading the series. Kelowna picks Zoe up because of course he does. She exists to me manhandled. What woman doesn't? I will wait here, I heard Darius say before the door closed with a sickening thud of finality, shutting my friends out and leaving me alone with my enemy, a fallen angel, and the monstrous bird creature his ancient lust had created. The raven mockers are products of rape, and I feel like calling it lust devalues that, as if he was just so overcome with lust that Kelowna couldn't help himself by forcing himself on women. It's not his fault, he's just too 
horny and lustful. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, Zoe faints again. Chapter 18. Zoe comes to, pretends to be asleep still because Nyx is telling her to so she can conveniently eavesdrop on Neferay. The elements weren't fully manifested and glaringly obvious, but they were around me, soothing and strengthening, making me worried as hell for my friends. Go back to the others, I ordered the elements silently and felt their reluctant departures. So are these elements sentient or what? Because they seem to feel stuff. <laughs> she stared. I do not doubt that she will regain consciousness soon. There was a pause, and I could hear her moving as if she were pacing as she continued to speak. I still say I should have not healed her. Zoe's death could have been easily explained. She was almost dead when she arrived here. What I've told you is the complete truth, Neferet said. She controls the elements. Then we can use her. Why not include her in our new vision of the future? Having her allegiance would sway any members of the council who would not readily succumb to me. New vision of the future? Swaying the council? As in the High Council of Vampires? Holy crap! Neferet's response was smooth and confident. We don't need her, my love. Our plan will succeed. This is just very, very childish. Having the bad guy like stay in the same room as their nemesis and say all of this bad guy exposition dumping stuff in front of their rival. No one would actually do this. And we're meant to believe that Neferet is smart enough to invoke Kelowna and manipulate him and take on the council, but dumb enough to reveal her plans in front of Zoe. Behave. She is young and not wise enough to allow her eyes to be open to more intriguing possibilities, as mine have been. Their voices were so close together that I knew she must be in his arms. Why are they hugging like lovers while staring at Zoe's supposedly unconscious body? Pair of weirdos. I can only read my script properly if I talk like a robot. No, I want you to stay away from her, Neferet snapped. You would do well to remember who is master here. I will not be ruled or commanded or trapped ever again, and I am not your impotent goddess. What I give, I will take away if I am displeased. The sexy silkiness was gone from Colonna's voice and a terrible coldness had replaced it. Don't be angry. Neferet was instantly contrite. It is just that I cannot bear to share you. Neferet is so insecure to be constantly competing against a teenager. Come with me from this room and I promise I will not displease you, Neferet said teasingly. I could hear the disgusting moist sounds of them kissing. Neferet's breathless moans were enough to make me gag. After way too many totally R-rated nasty sound effects, Colonna finally said, go to our chamber. Ready yourself for me. I will follow you there shortly. See? Pair of exhibitionists. N Zoe realises that Neferet is manipulating Colonna with her sex appeal. See? Cunning enough to manipulate a demigod who has been around for thousands of years, but not cunning enough to not fall into the trap of super villain monologuing. Neferet leaves and Zoe is all, OMG, I can feel Colonna's eyes on me and he's so beautiful, OMG. And that was it. No matter what instincts were screaming at me, I couldn't keep my eyes closed any longer. Sure that I was going to be looking up his indescribably perfect face, I opened my eyes to find myself staring up at the mutated features of Rafaim. The raven mocker was bent over me, his terrible bird face just inches from mine. His beak was open and his tongue was flicking in my direction. So does this mean that Rafaim was in the room the whole time and had to watch Colonna and Neferet nastily making out? No wonder he's all screwed up. Zoe screams, Darius comes in and throws a knife at Rafaim that... Is it Refrain or Refaim? Refrain. Colonna strangles Darius. I don't know if he was there the whole time. Zoe yells. It all kicks off within a matter of three paragraphs. But one thing did happen. As I looked at Colonna, I saw his blazing amber eyes and how his teeth were bared in a feral smile. And I understood that he was enjoying slowly choking the life from Darius. At that moment, Colonna's true self was revealed to me. He was not a misunderstood hero who was waiting for love to bring out his good side. Colonna didn't have a good side. Whether he had always been like this or not wasn't important. What he'd become, what he was now, was evil. The spell he had worked over me shattered like a dream made of glass. I hoped desperately that it was too broken to be ever pieced together back again. Okay. First of all, hilarious that Zoe was being gun. I can fix him, girly. But also, I swear she still struggles with fancying him even after all of this. So, drawing a deep breath, I raised my hands, palms out, not caring that the sheet fell away from my body, leaving me standing there naked. Darius does not need to see that. Poor Rafaim as well. Zoe uses the elements to get Colonna to stop killing Darius and Stark runs in to shoot Darius but stares at Zoe's naked body instead. Stark, don't shoot him, I cried. I didn't bother to try to block his view of Darius. If Stark shot, he wouldn't miss no matter what I did. He couldn't miss. What if Nyx created someone who could never get hit by any projectiles? Unstoppable force, immovable object. Universe implodes and we would finally be free of this wretched book series. Zoe covers herself back up and tries to convince everyone not to kill Darius. I held my breath during a long pause. Colonna stared at me and I stared right back at him. The weird hypnotic allure I felt for him hadn't returned. Not that he wasn't totally the most gorgeous man I'd ever seen. He definitely was. Then I felt a little start of surprise as I realised exactly what I was seeing as I gawked at him. 
Kelowna had gotten younger. When he'd first risen from his imprisonment in the earth, he'd been utterly and completely handsome, but he'd also been a man. Well, one that was abnormally big and had huge black wings, but still, a man. He'd had an ageless look about him, appearing anywhere from 30 to 50, but that had changed. If I had to guess his age, I'd say he was about 18. Definitely no older than 21. He's the perfect age for me. See? didn't even last until the end of the chapter to start fantasizing about him again. Kelowna decides to not kill Darius but cuts his face instead. And I wasn't drawn to him. His spell didn't work on me. Young and inhumanly beautiful as he was, I still saw him as a dangerous- Make up your mind. Make up your mind. He bent and whispered from my ears alone. Remember, my little Aya, the warrior can protect you from all others except me. Not even the power of your elements can keep me from claiming what will eventually be mine again. Then he pressed his lips against mine and the wild taste of him was like a blizzard rushing through my body, numbing my resistance and free using my soul with a forbidden desire that utterly overwhelmed me. His kiss made me forget everything and everyone. Stark, Darius, and even Heath and Eric were frozen from my mind. What a fucking shit show. Chapter 19. Kelowna leaves. Stark is freaking out over wanting Darius's blood. Zoe yells at Stark. He storms off too. I believe it will annoy Aphrodite, he said. Huh? He started to smile but ended the attempt of a grimace as the movement caused more blood to pour from the wound. He pointed at his face. She won't like the scar. No faith in Aphrodite and that's his her boyfriend. She's not actually shallow, unlike Zoe. Plus, Aphrodite is the only woman who doesn't fancy Kelowna either, proving that she's not shallow. Shut up. Okay, yes, it does sound like a total contradiction. The fact that I love the taste and smell of blood, but that seeing it pouring out of a friend's body grosses me out. Wait, no, maybe it's not a contradiction because hello, I don't eat my friends. Who are you talking to? Go away. Zoe feels healed enough to go back to the tunnels. I wanted to deny it, but then I remembered what he called me just before he kissed me. It had been the same name he called me during my nightmare. My response to him is almost automatic, as if my soul recognises him. My mind whispered traitorously. Ugh. And can we just remind ourselves that not only does every single hot boy ever fancy Zoe, but now a demigod does too. <sighs> She helps clean Darius's face. Then he and I searched through the cabinets because I was not going anywhere with a sheep wrapped round me. Okay, you would not believe the gross paper thin backless hospital gowns. Oh please, they are so not real gowns. We found in one drawer. Why is it hospitals make you wear ugly too revealing stuff when you already feel awful? It just makes no sense. And what's the deal with airplane food? The school is very quiet and the raven mockers are guarding the grounds everywhere. We are now 60% of the way through this and all that has really happened is Zoe almost died and then she went back to school. They cloak themselves with the elements and hide from the raven mockers, traveling to Zoe's dorm, but she hears a scream. Content warning, sexual abuse. <sighs> I say in a chipper voice. <sighs> No, really, I just want to get back to my room, the frightened girl's voice said. You can get back after I'm done with you. I froze, pulling Darius to a stop with me and as I recognised the guy's voice even before the girl answered him. How about later, Stark? Then maybe we can. Her words were abruptly cut off. I heard a little scream that ended in a gasp and then there was the awful wet sound and the moans began. Chapter 20. What Stark was doing was a twisted mockery of the goodnight kissing that usually went on there. He was holding a girl in what could have been an embrace had it not been obvious that just seconds before his teeth had locked onto her neck, she'd been trying to get away from him. I watched, horrified, as Stark, oblivious to our presence, continued his attack on her. It didn't matter that the girl was now moaning with sexual pleasure. I mean, we all know that's what happens when a vamp bites someone. The sex receptors in both the victim, and in this case she was definitely his victim, glad you pointed that out Zoe, and the vamp was stimulated. She was physically feeling pleasure, but her wide terrified eyes and the rigidity of her body made it obvious that she would fight him if she could. Stark was drinking in huge gulps from her throat. His moans were feral, and the hand that wasn't holding her tight against his body was fumbling at the girl's skirt, lifting it so he could situate himself between her legs. And it cuts off there. Stark attempts to assault this girl. And not to take us out of the moment, right? But at this point, I did some Googling about the series. Don't know why. And I found out this. Lots of people believe the books were co-authored by PC and Kristen Cast, which is understandable considering the books are all printed with both names on the covers. Kristen Cast actually just served as an editor for the books, in particular advising her mother on how to write teen characters. <laughs> yeah, right. Given how she herself was a teenager when the books were written. And PC Cast was the sole author. Somehow, this makes everything so much worse. All the offensiveness comes entirely from the mum. I'm lenient to teenagers being offensive. So me. I think it's normal and natural for teenagers to test boundaries, be a bit offensive, be a bit dumb, right? Not be rational. So me. 13 year old tweeted something stupid and offensive. It's none of my business. I probably wouldn't like be, I wouldn't be asked. I would, why would I be asked, right? But like a 40 year old tweeting the same thing, it's different. Some people don't think, I think it's different. That's just me. I'm stunning and brave, I know. So 
I thought that a lot of the offensive stuff, you know, using the R slur or making fun of, which they do with, with the word short burst and special needs and that stuff. I thought, because it's immature, I thought that came from the daughter. Maybe some of it still did. But the fact that PC Cast, the older one, was the sole author and was writing, like like someone that's old enough to know better makes it all so much worse, I think. Blew my mind when I read that. Anyway, back to the horror show. Darius stops Stark and Zoe sees pulsing liquid darkness around him, like the same darkness she saw in the tunnels and on Nefret. That's because the real enemy of the series is watery darkness and a giant bull. I'm not joking. Stark threatens to kill Darius and Zoe intervenes. Your bloodlust is controlling you, Darius said. If you weren't under its control, you wouldn't have had to force yourself on that fledgling. Yeah, you think so? Well, you're wrong. I happen to like my bloodlust. I liked doing whatever I want with that girl. Oh, I shouldn't be taking the piss away, should I? It's time vampires stop slinking around. We're smarter, stronger, better, harder, better, faster, stronger than humans. We should be in charge, not them. That fledgling isn't a human. Darius's voice was like the naked blade, reminding me that he wasn't just a big brother type of guy. He was a son of Erebus and one of the most powerful warriors alive. I was thirsty and there wasn't a human handy. Mm -hmm. Zoe keeps mentioning Duchess, the dog, to Stark to try to get him to be a normal person. Being a normal person in this book, challenge, impossible. Well, I've spent some time with the red fledgling too. Not to mention that the first ever changed red vamp is my best friend. Stevie Ray is different than she used to be, but I still love her, I said. Maybe if you spent some time with Stevie Ray and the rest of the red fledglings, you could, I don't know, find yourself again. They have. It's fine that he just tried, just seconds ago, tried to assault a girl, but that's fine because he's still good inside, guys. You don't understand. He can still be redeemed. But all of those girls were like skanks and sluts. No way. Warning bells were ringing like a fire alarm in my head. Nyx is allowing this to happen, by the way, and I wouldn't be remiss in assuming that Stark has already ass assaulted someone else, considering how he was speaking about Becca, the girl that he was trying to assault. So Nyx is allowing Nefret to turn fledglings into mindless killing and assaulting machines and won't interfere because free will and yet constantly does interfere by telling Zoe what to do, say, think, feel, etc. Bollocks. The darkness around Stark evaporates and he looks all innocent and sad again. What if there's nothing left in me worth loving, he asked in a voice so low that I ha if I hadn't been standing close to him I wouldn't have heard him. I think you can still choose. Why is this so fucking hard to read? I think you can still choose what you are or at least what you are becoming. Stevie Ray chose her humanity over the monster. I think it's up to you. He just tried to assault a girl in front of her and she's like, ooh, ooh you can still be good though if you choose to be ooh, ooh. I know what I did next was stupid I'm not even sure why I did it I mean I already had unresolved issues with Eric and Heath the last thing I needed was another boy complicating my life but at that moment there was only Stark and me and he was himself again the guy who had agonized over the gift Nyx had given him because he had accidentally caused the death of his mentor the guy who had been horrified at the thought of hurting anyone again the guy I'd felt such an immediate and deep connection to I'd thought that maybe there really were such things as soulmates and he had con and had considered at least for a few brief moments that he might be mine. That's all I was thinking about as I stepped into his arms. When he bent and hesitantly pressed his lips to mine, I closed my eyes and kissed him softly and sweetly. He kissed me back, holding me so gently it was as if he thought I might break. Moments after trying to assault a girl, Zoe's like, this will be a good idea. When he was gone, I stood there staring after him, wondering what the hell was wrong with me. How could I have kissed a guy who had been attacking someone just minutes before? I could be wrong, but you might be a misogynist. Chapter 21. Zoe rings Stevie Ray and tells her to go to Sister Mary Angela's because they are being watched in the tunnels. Becca is with the twins and Damien. Really, I'm fine. It was no big deal. Becca was insisting in a voice that wasn't shaky or scared anymore, but it suddenly changed to sound incredibly annoyed. No big deal, Shawnee said. Of course it was a big deal. The guy attacked you, Erin said. It wasn't like that, Becca said, waving her hands dismissively. We were just messing around. Plus, comma, Stark is really hot. Erin snorted. Yeah, I usually find rapists majorly hot. Maybe the reason I'm having such difficulty reading this is because it's just written badly. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. Becca's eyes narrowed and she looked cold and mean. Stark is hot and you're just jealous that he didn't want you. Didn't want me, Erin said incredulously. Don't you mean didn't want to molest me? Why are you making excuses for him? What the hell's wrong with you, Becca? Shawnee said. No guy should ever get away with. So Becca is being brainwashed by Kelowna's influence to be fine with what just happened. On the way up the staircase, Darius said, is Aphrodite in her room? Yeah, she said she was tired, Shawnee said. She's probably hanging upside down from the ceiling in her usual back perch, Erin said. She glanced over her shoulder at Darius and added, speaking of Aphrodite, 
She's going to give birth to a big old litter of kittens when she sees that you've messed up your pretty face. Yeah, and if you need comfort from her shallow hatefulness, you can try a little cafe mocha over here, Shorty said, waggling her eyebrows at him. Or a vanilla smoothie over here. Yeah, I bet you're vanilla, Erin flirted. Aphrodite is the sole reason that any of them are alive and they repay her by calling her a slut and flirting with her boyfriend. With friends like these... I call dibs on it if Aphrodite disembowels you for hitting on her man, Damien said. She's just a human now, Erin said. Yeah, we figure we can take her together. How is it that Aphrodite lost everything due in part to her dismissive attitude towards humans in the first book, but the twins are allowed to be the same with no consequence? It's surprising that the twins weren't friends of Aphrodite when she was a bully, considering they are just as hateful as Aphrodite's former friends. It doesn't make sense. Aphrodite sees Darius's wound and isn't shallow about it, surprise, surprise, but is genuinely concerned because she's a good person. All the cats have disappeared from campus, but Zoe's gang's cat and a few others are hiding in their room. The cats hate the birdmen, I said. Whenever Nala's been around me and one's been around, she totally freaked. There's more to it than that. If it was just about them hating them, then the cats would all be hiding, not just the special cats hanging out here, Aphrodite said. Maybe that's it, Damien said. There's something special about these particular cats. Yeah, even their cats are special. Speaking of, Shawnee said, what was the deal of you agreeing with that bimbo about, oh, no big deal because Stark's so hot. Talk about annoying. You weren't going to get through to her. Becca's on their side. As far as I can tell, Stark and the birds in Kelowna do anything to anyone and there are no repercussions for their actions. It's worse than no repercussions, Aphrodite said. Still within Darius's arm, she'd gotten herself together. It's like Kelowna's cast a spell over everyone and the spell somehow extends to Stark and the birds. So Becca, the victim, is being mind controlled into being okay with getting assaulted, but Stark isn't really under mind control. He's just letting himself be influenced by the darkness that is always, I think it's like always around and always influencing or something. It's not Kelowna specifically, something like that. Also, all of the professors love Kelowna and the bird men are everywhere. Chapter 22. Getting out of here isn't going to be easy as it was last time, Damien said. Aphrodite snorted, as if that was easy. It will be compared to what we're against now, Damien continued. Raven mockers are everywhere. Last night, they were attacking people randomly. It was mass confusion then, so that helped us slip away. Today, they're well organised station all over. It's only been, canonically, one day in this entire book so far. PC cast sense of time pisses me off. That bastard choked you, Aphrodite said. Damn, that pisses me off. Oh, an abbreviated herd of nerd. In case you didn't get the first time, get this. I'm not in the least affected by the mojo the winged freak lays on you. I don't like him at all. That's right, I said. I noticed that earlier today. You really don't feel drawn to him at all? What's to be drawn to? He's a big old bully and he's never dressed properly. And I really don't like birds. I mean, the bird flu is supposed to be a seriously unattractive way to die. So no, he's got nothing for me. I wonder why his stuff doesn't work on you, I mused aloud. Because she's Abby normal, Shawnee said. A serious freak in a human skin suit, Erin said. How about because I'm exceptionally intuitive and I see for his bullshit? Oh, that also means I see for yours too, Aphrodite said. Yeah, according to the twins, Aphrodite seeing Kelowna for what he is, evil, means she must be the freak. So the vampires who are more psychic than others are resistant to Kelowna. And as per usual, Damien got it right away. Dragon, Professor Anastasia and Professor Lenobia. They're who I consider the most intuitive after Neferet. It's no coincidence that the cats are here with us, Darius said. They're a sign sent to us to let us know we're on the right track. Not interfering. Nope. Zoe decides to stay the night to attend classes to speak to the professors she thinks she can trust. I added, hey, I wonder why Stark so under Kelowna's spell. He has a major gift from Nyx and before he died, he seemed really intuitive. Stark is an absolute asshole, Shawnee said. Yeah, between what we heard from the other kids and what went on with Becca, we can definitely say he's seriously bad news, Erin said. Dying and then undying might have messed him up, but my vote is that he was a jerk before he croaked and then uncroaked, Aphrodite said. We all need to stay far, far away from him. And I think his badness is right up there with Kelowna and Nefret. I don't think he's under Kelowna's spell at all. I kissed him again and my friends all thought he was such a monster he probably because he was a monster and if he's such bad news which it seriously looks like he is how the hell could i think there's anything good left in him because he's hot you would not care if he was butters. She's upset because I was going to have a massively ugly scar and I'd probably never be able to wear a tank top again. And what about if I ever wanted to let anyone see me, well, naked again? I mean, I'd had one bad experience, but surely someday I was going to be in a great relationship and I want him to eventually see me naked, right? I stared at the nasty looking unhealed scar and stifled a sob. Wrong. I hastily pulled the t-shirt of my head and muttered, Aphrodite must be rubbing off on me. I swear I didn't used to be this shallow. 
You never needed Aphrodite to be this shallow. Zoe falls asleep and dreams, but realizes she's in the place where Aphrodite had seen a vision of her dying. Chapter 23. Alona appears and is all, Aya, you called me here. And she's all, oh my God, he's so fit. She kept caressing my hair as he answered me. Aya had been gone for centuries, dissolved once more as the earth that made her. You are simply she, reborn through the daughter of man. That is why you are different from the others. Even Kelowna has fallen prey to telling Zoe how special she is. Are you quite sure you didn't know me? I could feel the cold of his skin radiating toward my body and I wanted to lean into him. My heart was beating hard again, only this time it wasn't from fear. I wanted to be close to this fallen angel worse than I'd wanted anything ever in my life. The desire I felt for him was even more than the pull of Heath's imprinted blood. What would it be like to taste Kelowna's blood? The thought made me shiver with the delicious forbidden impulse. You feel it too, he murmured. You were made for me. You belong to me. Zoe, please have a man cleanse, I beg. Anyway, his words annoy Zoe. So she's all, um, I don't belong to you. Hurrah, feminism. I belong to myself and to Nick's. Boo, religion. He looked vaguely amused. Yes, it was my choice that brought me here. Well, why did you do it? What do you want? Another change came over his features. He blazed with a brilliance that could only be immortal. Kelowna stood, threw his arms wide as his wings unfurled, spreading around him with a magnificence that made it hard for me to look at him and impossible for me to look away from him. Everything, he cried in the voice of a god. I want everything. <laughs> Great dialogue, mate. Very compelling characterization. They kiss, and at first, Zoe is all, ugh, take me. And then she changes her mind because she doesn't want to be a dirt doll woman. Fair enough, I guess. She wakes up and Stark is in her room. Okay, Edward Cullen, I see you. Chapter 24. I was walking by in the hall out there and I heard your cat yowling and hissing and then you started yelling. I thought you were in trouble. Stark glanced over from my heavily draped window. Yeah, sure, mate, I believe you. Thousands wouldn't. They'll make you hate me, he blurted. Who's they? And no one's going to make me feel anything. As soon as I said it, a picture of me in Kelowna's arms flashed through my mind, but I, was purp but I purposefully shoved the all too graphic image away. They? Everyone, he said. They'll tell you I'm a monster and you'll believe them. Oh no, baby boy, of course assaulting women doesn't make you a monster. No one cares about women in these books, you're fine. He was talking in short clip sentences, as if what he was saying was hard for him to get out. Okay, yeah, I have urges, especially when I haven't had any blood recently. But that's not really feeling, it's just a reaction. You know, eat, sleep, live, die. <laughs> That's because he eats, sleep, rave, repeat. It's automatic, he grimaced and looked away from me. It's automatic for me to take what I want, like from that girl. Well, I guess it's fine then, right? <laughs> You attacked her. You forced yourself on her. Look, it's pretty simple. If you don't want people to say bad things about you, then you need to stop doing bad things, I said. His eyes flashed and I saw a red light in their depth. She would have liked it. If you and the warrior had come along five minutes later, you would have seen her all over me. So he's definitely done it before then to know this, right? I'm going to confirm that he is a serial rapist. That is my head canon. And he gets totally forgiven within this book, by the way. So that's something to look forward to. And you think that makes what you did okay. You messed with her mind to get her to want to be with you. By any definition, that's a violation and it's wrong. You kissed me right after that and I didn't have to mess with your mind. That's got nothing to do with anything, really. You're just saying words now. Maybe that's because I'm the only person who's telling you the truth right now. As I spoke, I got one of my gut deep feelings that let me know I was saying the words Nyx would have me speak. Nice to know Nyx condones assault just as long as Zoe finds the guy who does it hot. Stark's smile faded instantly. The goddess couldn't want anything to do with me. Not anymore. I think you'd be surprised. Remember Aphrodite? He nodded. Yeah, kinda. She's that really stuck up chick who actually thinks she's a love goddess. That's Aphrodite. She and Nyx are like this. I cross my fingers. Not a good example to use when Nyx keeps like genuinely, physically, mentally torturing Aphrodite. Nyx is kind of the worst, isn't she? Maybe Kelowna has a point. Stark tells Zoe that Kelowna finds it harder to get into girls' dreams if they are sleeping in bed with a guy. Sure. He also says most of the sons of Erebus are dead because they attacked Kelowna when Shekinah was killed. Look, he said, abruptly changing the subject. You want to get some sleep? I'm tired too. What if we sleep together? Just sleep together. I promise I won't try anything. She's still with Eric in a relationship with- this book is hilarious. At first she says no, but then- changes her mind and agrees to it. Sounds good to me. So I think you have to be touching whoever you're sleeping with for this to really work. His voice sounded weirdly intimate coming from the dark just beside me. Yeah, sure. My stomach felt all fluttery and not just because we've been talking about spiders. Isn't this a variation on that trope? You know, like two people are in a hotel and there's only one bed left. Everything is derivative, nothing is original. Yes. On one hand, right about then, was an excellent opportunity for me to mention the little fact that Eric and I were supposed to be back together and maybe even say something about Heath or maybe not. On the other hand, I was trying to somehow fix the kid's humanity or lack thereof, and it probably wouldn't help for me to be all, hey, I'll sleep with you and act like I care about you, but I kind of have a boyfriend. Or two. Ah, yes, of course, you're sleeping in a bed with him to help his humanity. That'll do it. Sure, Zoe. 
And besides all that, I needed to start being honest with myself. Eric had seemed so perfect for me. He's who everyone thought I should be with. Then why have I always liked other guys too? And then that's even before he started acting all insanely possessive. Because you're selfish. It's fine if you want to be with different people at once, but you have to be honest with the other person. So the other person can decide whether that's something they can do. Otherwise you're just being a cheat. She's being dishonest right now by not telling Stark that she basically has two boyfriends. Stark is all, I liked seeing you naked. And then he's all, by the way, if I become a real monster, set me on fire. Great segue, mate. Would you do something for me? I asked sleepily. I think I'd do almost anything for you, Stark said. Stop calling yourself a monster. You saw him trying to assault someone. Zoe would definitely have defended Ted Bundy. Zoe would have been one of those people that went to the courtrooms to try to ask his hand in marriage. Chapter 25. Stark was gone when I woke up, feeling majorly refreshed as well as starving. I stretched and yawned, which is when I found the arrow lying on the pillow beside me. He'd broken it in half, which immediately caught my attention. I mean, I'm from a town called Broken Arrow. I know what the symbolism of an arrow snapped in half means. Peace, an end to fighting. There was a note folded underneath the arrow pieces with my name printed on it. I opened it and read, I watched you while you were sleeping. I like watching you sleep. <laughs> and you look completely at peace. I wish I could feel that. I wish I could close my eyes and feel at peace, but I can't. I can't feel anything if I'm not with you. And even then all I can do is want something that I don't think I can ever have, at least not now. So I left this and my peace with you. Stark, what a dramatic little bitch. Zoe joins the twins for breakfast and notices that everyone else has turned into a pod person. The twins mention seeing Stark. The butt ball walked through here while you were still upstairs. All like he owned the place and didn't care who he'd been hmm, and pillaging some poor helpless pod girl, Sean Eastead, still keeping her voice down. Yeah, you should have seen Becca. She panted R to him like a terrier, Erin said. And what did he do? I asked, holding my breath. It was pathetic. He barely looked at her, Sean Eastead. Talk about being used and then wadded up and thrown away like a snot rag, Erin said. You know they're fully making fun of the victim right here, right? Stark appears and the twins are rightfully rude to him, so he snaps at them. It's all conflicting because it's nice to see them taken down a few pegs, even if they're like right to be rude to him. Stark gives Zoe her missing purse and leaves. Zoe complains that her teacher is a pod person. I looked up from my totally boring worksheets to where she was sitting at her desk, blob-like, staring stone-faced at her computer screen. Her charisma in class today would definitely fall on the self-intermediate high school crap teacher scale at about the level of Miss Foster, who had consistently gotten the prize for worst English teacher ever. And she'd been called the queen of workshops or Oompa Loompa, depending on whether she was wearing her m M&M blue moo moo or not. What are you talking about? What is that sentence? She goes to a sociology class taught by Neferet, which is wild why go why do whatever so i want you to read this chapter on your own your assignment will be to document in a journal all of your dreams for the next five days often secret desires as well as abilities surface in our dreams before you go to sleep i want you to focus on your reading and think about what concealment means to you what dark secrets do you keep hidden from the world where would you go if no one could find you what would you do if no one could see you she's not even a good villain it's so obvious what she's up to how convenient she wants everyone, as in Zoe, to do a dream journal whilst everyone's busy dreaming of Kelowna. Behave. Neferet makes Zoe read aloud that vampiric cloaking ability cannot be used on inorganic matter like cars as a way to warn Zoe to not sneak off campus. And I feel like this is a lazy approach to writing conflict. Why would Neferet give Zoe the heads up that way? Why wouldn't she just let Zoe attempt to escape in a car only to fail and then feel more trapped or God forbid even someone dies in the attempt, you know? Chapter 26. Zoe has fencing with Dragon Langford next. At first, Dragon appears to be another of my grandma's conundrums. First of all, he's short. Second, he's cute. <sighs> Whatever. In a world where male vampires were warriors and protectors, some matriarchy. Slowly and distinctly, he winked at me before turning back to class. About then, his huge Maine Coon padded up to sit beside me and lick one of his monstrous paws. Hey there, Shadowfax. I scratched his head and felt more hopeful than I had since the Raven Mocker had almost killed me. Well, considering that happened a whopping 10 hours ago, that's not really saying much, is it? Zoe, Damien and the twins meet in the cafeteria and swap information. Professors Dragon and Anastasia can be trusted. We all ate silently while I thought, but not about the vocab word ubiquitous. Seriously, I could have thought about that forever and not figured out what that meant. I'll help you. English lesson with Elise Easy. The stupidity in this series is ubiquitous. Cue someone from the comment section saying, you're doing it wrong. They decide to meet at the stables later and Aphrodite joins them. The others leave so that Zoe can talk to Aphrodite privately. We're not going back to the depot tunnels when we leave here. We're going to the Benedictine Abbey. Her gaze on me was sharp and way more intelligent than most people gave her credit for. <laughs> She's easily more intelligent than you, mate. 
As I spoke, I felt that sureness within me that told me Nyx was pleased with the choices I was making. But she's not interfering, anything but that. Aphrodite tells Zoe that Stevie Ray lied to her and that there are more red fledglings in the tunnels, but presumably they are bad, hence Stevie Ray lying about them. Hey, she said softly, try not to let this thing of Stevie Ray freak you out. She's keeping secrets, but I can also tell you that she cares about you. A lot. I also know she's choosing good, no matter how hard it is for us sometimes. See, Aphrodite is the best character. She's being nice about Stevie Ray, who she hates. And I hate too. Eric and I used to have a thing, but you know that's way over. You can talk to me if you need to. I looked at her and again thought how ironic it was that she was right. I really could talk to her. She's Zoe's real best friend. I don't know why everyone else is in denial about it. I'm not sure I want to be of Eric, I blurted. Her eyes got a little wider, but her voice said nonchalant. He's pressuring you about sex? I shrugged. Yes, no, kind of, but it's not just that. I leaned forward and lowered my voice. Aphrodite, did he ever get possessive and uber jealous of you? She curled her lip in a sarcastic sneer. He tried. I don't so much tolerate the jealous bullshit. Then she paused and in a more serious tone added, neither should you, Z. Zoe's other friends, especially Damien, would be all like, oh my god, but he's a good guy and he's so hot because they make me sick. But you know, if there wasn't the constant internalized misogyny and slut shaming and uh, not taking abuse seriously, this would be a good message to have in a book for teens. She hesitated then added, I hope you're not still thinking about Stark. I shrugged and took a massive bite of spaghetti. Look, I did some asking around and the boy is wrong. Period. The end. Just forget about him. Actually, it's okay that he's a serial abuser because Zoe thinks he's hot, so you're wrong. Yeah, right. I still remember how you were the night Stark died. He got to you. But you have to remember the Stark that's shutting around here, acting like he's all that and basically using girls and throwing them aside after he fucks their minds even more than their bodies is not the guy who died in your arms. What if he's that guy but he just needs to change like Stevie Ray did? Well, I can promise you I'm not giving up another piece of my humanity to save his ass. Shit, Zoe. Eric's a better bet than Stark. Are you hearing me? No, he just needs his humanity back. Who cares about all of the people that he's hurt? I mean, they don't even care because they've been brainwashed not to care. So I guess it's fine. Chapter 27. I appreciate that this is a bit of a jump scare considering how nice my makeup looked prior, but well, I had a migraine all morning and it's gone now. So that's my pathetic life story. Chapter 27. Zoe goes to drama class. Oh my God, he was not with me, even though I so wish he had been. Becca's annoying exclamation mark snagged my attention from being disgruntled at Eric's. She was talking in gaspy little starts. Stark, of course. He's only the hottest guy at the house at night. Well, if you don't count Colonna, Becca said. CFF, both of them, Cassie said. CFF, I asked. Completely freaking fine, Becca said. I realised afterwards that I should have kept my mouth shut. I mean, I was attempting to converse with what amounted to brainwashed pod people, but I couldn't stay out of it. And yes, I knew that some of my pissed offness came from a totally inappropriate feeling of jealousy. Um, excuse me, Becca, I said, heavy on the sarcasm. But didn't Darius and I recently save your butt from getting raped and bit by, ooh, the hottest guy at the house at night? Then you were snotting and whimpering. What's crazy is that Zoe knows Becca is a victim and she knows that Becca can't help herself because she's also brainwashed. So she's a brainwashed victim and yet Zoe's still popping off and being vile to her. Usually these types of books can't even tell when someone's actually a victim of something, but I feel like this is worse. Because the text knows she's a victim, and yet Zoe is still being a bully. It's crazy. Yeah, just because you're all high and mighty with the elements doesn't mean you can have any guy you want. Well, that's where you're wrong, and I've got a whole series to prove it. I clamped down on my urge to shriek at her and tried to reason instead. Becca, you're not thinking clearly. Last night when Darius and I broke it up between you and Stark, he was forcing you to let him suck your blood and he was on the verge of hmm you. I hated saying it. I especially hated knowing it was true. And you still want to be with this boy. Why? Wow, the bar really is like on the floor for House of Night Men, isn't it? Kelowna comes in so Zoe fawns over how yummy his six pack is. Kelowna is taking over drama class because clearly a demigod has nothing better to do. His amber eyes widened in surprise and then he smiled and said, how delightful that my first question comes from those special of all fledglings. Yes, Zoe, what answer may I give you? I feel like this is making me even more ill. Also, way to rub it in to everyone else in the class how special Zoe is. With you taking over drama, I was just wondering if that meant you expect Eric Knight to be gone for quite some time. 
Okay, I hadn't wanted to ask him a question, but my instincts had made me raise my hand, just as my instincts were telling me what to say. I knew taunting him with the fact that Eric had escaped was dangerous, but I was doing so in a way that I hoped wouldn't give him a reason for outright anger. I just wasn't sure why I was being prompted to bait an already volatile immortal. Yeah, Nyx really doesn't interfere. Now, sweet Zoe, or as I like to think of you, Aya, I give you the honour of choosing what piece of work we shall study first. Be wary, the entire class must abide by your choice, and know that I shall play the lead in whatever you choose. He strode away from me. All these vampires and gods are so theatrical. He strode over to my side of the room. I was at the desk that sat second to the front, directly behind Becca, and I swear I could see her tremble at his nearness. This is also incredibly, like, fan fiction e A demigod has taken over drama class as a way to force proximity on the object of his lust. What in the Wattpad? He threatens to hurt Eric, but I, I can't force myself to care about that. Zoe picks the play Medea, but I'm sure nothing comes of this, so it's quite inconsequential. I think it's just a jab at Colonna's hubris. Okay. Why should she get noticed by him? It's not fair. If this is Nyx being mysterious, then I'm damn sick of it. Yeah, it's crap. If you're not Zoe Redbird, then you're not shit to Nyx. Nyx gives her anyone she wants. The goddess doesn't leave anything for the rest of us. This is hilarious because the other students are meant to be hypnotized pod people and they're being influenced by Kelowna not liking Nyx and this is meant to reflect that. And yet it's true. Everything they're saying is completely valid. So we're meant to disagree with them, right? We're meant to be like, no, how can you turn away from Nyx? She loves you. But how can we when they're spitting facts? What was more than obvious was that Kelowna was methodically tearing down the fledgling's love for Nyx and he was using me to help him. But it's true. Nyx doesn't give a shit about anyone except for Zoe and her friends and that doesn't even include Aphrodite. I was shaking. With one appearance, Kelowna had turned an entire class against me. I read this more as Kelowna is just the straw, the final straw that broke the camel's back and the resentment was there all along, simmer away in the background. Maybe if Nyx bothered to favour the others more, it wouldn't have been so easy for the students to turn away her and thus Zoe. Kelowna's been around for a day and already that it's like... It's like if aliens came to invade us and was like, we're like, we're taking over the world, take us to, like, we're replacing your leaders of government. I feel like most people now would just be like, great, come on, it can't be any worse than this. And I feel like that's what the students have done with Kelowna. Zoe goes to the stables, but an apparition of Nefere appears just to be annoying. And then the apparition explodes into illusory spiders. Then a raven mocker appears and we get this catchy dialogue. All oh, right, I am sick and tired of you. <laughs> it's the way my head is feeling really tender and I can feel it threatening to like come back because of this stupidity. I'm really out here risking my health and sanity for my audience. So remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I am sick and tired of you freaks and the way you and your daddy and nasty nephret thinks you can take over everything. Father says, find Zoe, and I find Zoe. Father says, watch Zoe, I watch Zoe. <laughs> no, no, no. If I wanted... <laughs> I'm going to start drooling in a minute. If I wanted a pain in the butt dad to follow me around and check up on me, I'd call the step loser. So to you, your daddy, and the rest of your bird boy brothers, and even to Nefret, I say... Get off my back. I think that's the worst thing I've ever read. The Raven Mocker flies off and then Stark is just there. Chapter 28. You're really something, you know? He grinned his cocky, cute, bad boy smile and before I could blink, he pulled me into his arms and kissed me. It wasn't a groping, intrusive kiss filled with possessiveness like I'd been experiencing with Eric. She's been back with Eric for one day and already cheated on him. Stark's kiss was more of a sweet question mark, which I answered with a definite exclamation point. Sure, I should have been pissed. I should have pushed him away and told him off instead of kissing him back enthusiastically. I'd like to be able to say that my semi-hoish reaction to him was because I'd had so much stress and fear in my life lately that I needed to escape, and his arms were the easiest escape available, which would imply I wasn't actually totally responsible for the fact that I was sucking face with Stark right there in the doorway to the stables. Why are you snogging a sex offender, babe? Heath is a better choice than this. She stopped kissing him. You know, from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that's how I think of the girls you bite and mess with their minds so that they're all, ooh, that's Stark, he's just so hot. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's seriously annoying. And by the way, if you ever try any of that crap with me, I promise that I will call all the five elements and we will kick your butt. 
count on it. I don't know what that was, I'm sorry. I wouldn't try to do that to you, but that's not saying I wouldn't like to taste you. I totally would. His voice had gone all sexy again. He started to step closer to me. He's fully aware of what he's been doing and you can't blame it on the darkness because he's totally coherent in this scene. So what the F, what the flip? You're fooling for me? Yeah, great, isn't it? I already have a vampire boyfriend and a human guy I've imprinted with and Brahms tomorrow. And as my grandma would say, my dance card is more than full. I can take care of the van boyfriend. Automatically Stark's hand came to stroke the bow that was strapped to his back. Hell no, you won't take care of him, I yelled. Get this through your head. That bow is not the fix or answer to your problems. It should be your very last resort and should never ever be used against another person, human or vampire. You used to know that. His face hardened. You know what happened to me. I'm not going to apologize for what's become my nature. So he's He's also a murderer or a wannabe murderer as well. Zoe really knows how to pick them. Your nature? Do you mean your spoiled brat nature or your slut nature? I think it's a little more serious than him just being a slut, Zoe. The slut shaming in this book is so unreal that a guy can be a sex offender and the cast are like, ew, what a slut. It means he gets around. I've had enough. I couldn't make the choice to do the right thing for him. And I suddenly understood that I wouldn't keep sneaking around and seeing him. If he couldn't be the kind of guy I was proud to be with in public, the act he put on for me in private didn't mean anything. And that was something he needed to know. Even if he decided to be good right now, it wouldn't change what he's been doing for the past few days. And as far as I remember, he never felt remorse or made amends for sexually assaulting numerous girls. And no, just protecting Zoe isn't good enough. He would need to make amends to all the people that he's hurt in a very serious way. Stark pledges himself as a warrior to Zoe. Stark, do you understand what you're doing? I knew about a warrior's pledge to a high priestess and it was an oath that often bound him to her service for his entire life and was often harder to break than an imprint. Knows girl for less than one week. Zoe accepts and Stark changes right in front of her, becoming an adult vampire and the second adult red vampire. Stark goes to dragon to go through some type of ritual, who cares? Nyx didn't suddenly appear before me and I hadn't expected her to, but I did feel a brief listening silence in the air around me and that was enough. I knew the goddess's hand was on Stark. Protect him. Strengthen him. Oh, and could you please help me figure out what I'm going to do about him? I prayed silently until the sixth hour bell rang. How about sending Nyx a prayer to protect the girls that he's been abusing or giving them the strength to deal with all the trauma they will have once the mind control is over? Nah, who cares about them? They're just silly girls after all. Chapter 29. Zoe goes to the horse stables to see her horse Persephone and Lenobia, the stable instructor. Zoe, Colonna must be killed. At least she's not wasting time. At least someone's not wasting time. Zenobia nodded her head. Yes, a few of us have been afraid of that. I'm ashamed to say we looked the other way instead of confronting Nefret when she was beginning to behave strangely. I no longer consider her in Nyx's service. I plan on pledging my allegiance to a new high priestess. She finished, giving me a knowing look. Lenobia has been a vampire for about two centuries and she's just lumping everything onto a fledgling teenager. I felt terrible and helpless and breathless and too darn young. I wanted to flail my arms around and scream, I'm 17, I can't save the world, I can't even parallel park. I think they've used that exact joke in a different book. Zoe shows Lenobia the prophetic poem she thinks is telling them how to get rid of Kelowna. They work out that the place of power needed to go to, um, shoo, because he's a bird, you know, Kelowna away is the Abbey of the Benedictine Nuns. How fortuitous, how coincidental. There are also five people needed to help with this plan. Stevie Ray is one of them, then sis Sister Mary Angela, Aphrodite, Grandma Redbird, and Zoe herself. It sounds really thrown together, and Zoe is very lucky that she has Nick's telling her what to do all the time. Because if she didn't, how would she work out that one of them is Sister Mary Angela? Like some nun that she's met like once or twice. If I'm right, I said a little shakily. Listen to your heart. Are you right? I drew a deep breath and searched inside me. Yes, it was there. The feeling I knew came from my goddess. The feeling that told me I'd gotten it right. <sighs> See, load of bollocks. Chapter 30, everyone else arrives. Do you need me to cast a quick circle? I asked. That is not the answer for everything, Zoe. I turned my back to them and unobtrusively peeked down the front of my shirt and I grimaced at what I saw. Okay, my scar wasn't a thin, long pink line. It was puckered and jagged and was still red and angry looking. I shifted my shoulders. No, it didn't really hurt. It was just sore and tender to the touch and ugly, really, really ugly. I forgot most of this book and I already knew that Nyx is going to give Zoe another tattoo tracing around her scar and she will suddenly then love her perceived imperfection because accepting yourself is important, except she wouldn't have accepted it without some pretty swirly tattoo or some other nonsense anyway. BFFR. 
Aphrodite has had a vision of Kelowna and Neferet starting a war with the humans. Also, raven mockers can sexually violate women. So remember that when Stevie Ray starts hooking up with one. It is Neferet, Lenobia said in a voice so calm it almost sounded dead. She is the impetus behind Kelowna. She has desired a war against the humans for many years. She met my eyes. So you knew this for many years and didn't bother to tell the High Council? Okay. You may have to kill her. I blanched. Kill Neferet? No way. I'm not doing that. You might have to, Darius said. Darius is the big manly warrior. Why doesn't he kill her? No, I cried again. If I was supposed to kill Neferet, I wouldn't have had this horrible sickness in my gut just thinking about it. Nyx would let me know it was her will, but I can't believe killing a high priestess of hers would ever be the goddess's will. Yeah, well, Nyx is also letting people run around violating fledglings, so I don't give a fuck about what she has to say. Lenobia suggests they travel via horse and has Zoe and Shawnee heat up the horseshoes so the horses can travel through all the ice without hurting the horses. Chapter 31. There's less than two chapters left. And I said, I don't know if they're going to have the showdown with Kelowna in this book. That will be far too rushed. Zoe finds herself having to explain about Stark. Okay, well, remember the poem? All of my friends narrowed their eyes at me, which I didn't think was very fair, but I continued anyway. It said I was supposed to save his humanity, and I did, I think. I hope. Priestess, we caught him abusing a fledgling. How can you condone that? Darius said. I don't condone it. It makes me sick. But I remember when Stevie Ray was fighting to keep her humanity and she was awful. I looked at Aphrodite. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and no one gave a shit then about how Stevie Ray and the fledglings murdered homeless people. It's only ever brought up to point out, ew, that's gross because homeless people are dirty, quotation marks. It's never brought up as you killed real people with lives and dreams. So, of course, Zoe doesn't give a real shit that Stark was abusing fledglings because all girls are sluts anyway, am I right? By pledging to you, Stark chose good, Darius said. I smiled. I like to think so. So that means he <laughs> he isn't an ass cake anymore, Aaron said. I thought you called him an ass bucket, Sean, he said. Twin, it's the same thing, Aaron said. It means I trust him, I said. And I wish you guys would give him a chance. Instantly forgiven. All is forgiven. No one cares. Stark faces zero consequences for his actions. Can people change yes can people redeem themselves from doing bad things well that depends on how the victim feels it's not really our place to say right some people would say yes like some victims of crimes would say yes to that some would say no right people can change can people change entirely in less than one day my brain just shut down <laughs> anyway they have this brilliant escape plan to get on with zoe makes a tree fall onto a wall and that's it. That's the plan. Chapter 32. She goes back to the group and the horses. The tree is meant to be a diversion. Here, I'll give you a knee up, Lenobia said, bending us, bending beside us and offering Damien the cradle her hands were making. With a long-suffering sigh, he put his knee in her hands and tried unsuccessfully to stifle a very a very gay squeal as she boosted him up on Persephone's broad back. Mm -hmm. Once we were all mounted, Lenobia led us to the rollaway doors that opened into the exercise coral. Earlier, Lenobia had quietly gone out and opened the outside gates to the coral. Now nothing stood between us and the world except a load of ice. The front gates of the school, a bunch of raven mockers, their daddy, and a crazed ass ex-high priestess. As you can imagine, I was pretty concerned about having a raging case of nervous diarrhea. You aren't as quirky as you think, babes. They set the horses' stalls on fire. The horses are fine. They've been told to run around and cause mayhem as a distraction. So don't worry, mates. They escape, but Lenobia stays behind. Raven mockers fly after them, so Darius shoots them with a gun. <laughs> okay. They get to the Benedictine Cumberbatch Abbey. Sister Mary Angela is there, but dozens of raven mockers have followed Zoe. Chapter 33. They cast a circle in the last chapter, but I really wasn't paying attention. I've become immune to any mentions of circle casting. The circle is protecting them from the raven mockers, and Stevie Ray is already there. They're nasty, all right, but they aren't doing anything except watching us, said another familiar voice. Eric, I cried, smiling, Stevie Ray let go of me, and Eric pulled me into his strong arms. Absolutely not. She was out of his sight for less than 24 hours, and she already slept in bed with another dude and snogged him. She's like Spencer Matthews from Old School Made in Chelsea. I looked up at Eric, and even in the middle of the mess we were in, I wished it could be simple and easy between the two of us. For that instant, I did wish it could be Eric and me, instead of Eric and Stark and Kelowna and Heath. She was just saying a few chapters ago that she wanted to be Stark's girlfriend. Get real. Zoe, Kelowna will be here soon. The reason the Raven Mockers aren't attacking is because we're not trying to get away anymore. There's about 10 pages of this book left. 
FYI. Kelowna and Neferet appear via a car. You cannot maintain that circle for eternity, Kelowna said as he walked slowly towards our little group. I, on the other hand, can maintain my pursuit of you for eternity. The audacity of all these men. The nun's hand swept towards Kelowna, causing the dark folds of her habit to billow gracefully. Nephilim, I recognise you. Um, actually, it's Nephilim. And actually, Nephilims are reptilians from the fourth dimension. So educate yourself, sheeple. Kelowna's laugh was terrible and it caused the raven mockers to hiss as they moved restlessly all around us. Ladies, do not battle over me. I am a god. There is enough of me for all of you to share. This book really is women arguing over mid-men, the novel. Zoe's grandma joins the circle in a wheelchair, but she's conscious. Did I hear you have need of me, my Uetsia Gea? This ending is so rushed, considering the first 100 pages were all a recount of the previous evening's events. Oh, sons of my mother's mothers, she cried out, and her voice carried like the sonorous beat of a tribal drum out into the night. What have you allowed him to make you become? Do you not feel your mother's blood? Can you not imagine their hearts breaking for you? Amazed, I watched several of the raven mockers turn their heads as if they were unable to face my grandma. In others, the red glow began to die in their eyes and I recognized sorrow and confusion in their human depths. I don't hate this. The raven mockers are products of rape. They are a weird mutation between human and raven led by an insane demigod. Can they help being messed up when they've known no differently. Like they're not exactly educated, are they? They're just whatever. It's a loaded conversation to have, but I feel more sympathy for them than I do for Stark, who was a normal human and then a normal fledgling, well, he had that gift, but whatever, for years, and he had normal moral and ethical codes. But all of that just like went because of some darkness. It's not really his fault, except he was totally coherent. And he was totally aware of what he was doing to people. But we're meant to feel sympathy for him. Like Stark knows what he's doing is wrong. I think there is a difference between Stark and the Raven Mockers. Also, the Raven Mockers end up facing some consequence as a bunch of them have been killed already, while Stark is immediately forgiven and redeemed by Zoe, who shouldn't be the one forgiving him in the first place. She's not a victim of his. And there's zero consequence for Stark thus far. And Earth completes. I held my hand out to Grandma. Do not let the Higo join them, Kelowna cried. Stark, kill her, Neferet commanded. Not Aya, Kelowna shouted. Kill the old Higo. Yeah, that'll make her love you more, mate. Kill the only maternal figure in her life. You dumb. For God, you are a dumbass. Neferet instead tells Stark to kill Zoe because she doesn't want to share Kelowna anymore. Neferet's dark power tries to influence Stark, but Stark decides to shoot his own heart instead of hurting Zoe, but Zoe uses the elements to destroy the arrow. Okay, mate, sure. Instead of cursing Kelowna, they decide to bless him, which hurts him because he's so evil i gazed into his incredible amber eyes and banished him with the truth because i choose love yes love in between all of the cheating slut shaming and victim blaming zoe chooses love oh and straight up murder like she's already killed a bunch of people the love creates a a glowing silver thread that whips nefret and cloner away like team rocket blasting off again the instant he disappeared from view, I felt a familiar burning spread across my chest. And the next time I looked in the mirror, I knew I would see another mark of my goddess's favour. Though this one would be mixed with scars and deep heartbreaking pain. F off. After this, Zoe checks Stark. He's fine, just a bit busted. Stark took it and stood slowly and painfully. Well, he said with that cocky smile I loved so much. Serving this lady might be cause for a whole new book of rules to be written. You're telling us, Eric said. Yeah, not something we don't already know, he said. Well, hell, I said, shaking my head at all of my boys. <laughs> Isn't Eric meant to be seething with jealousy at this point that there's yet another boy in this twisted thruple? The clouds disperse and they all look up at the moon and say a bunch of crap. The end. God, I love this book series. So that was House of Night, book five. I'll do book six. I might do it this month if you're lucky. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let me know, let me know what other videos or book series or whatever you want to see. Cause I want to do, I've been like really heavy on the book content for a year. So I want to kind of do some other things as well. Thanks to Rachel Oates for editing this video. Make sure you check out my podcast channel and my third channel. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.